Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll start as uh, when it's zero, zero, okay? Zero, zero. You bet. All right, there we go. Good. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Hope everybody had a little bit of sleep. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Adrian and Sheldon for the great restaurant last night. I hope everybody had a good time and enjoyed your meal and alcohol. <laughs> thank you, guys. Oops. Okay. So, 
Today we have another awardee who's going to be speaking to us for about 45 minutes. And it is Parang Arani, and I'm sure most of you know him. He's been in our discipline for a long time. And uh, I don't mean to say that you're old. <laughs> I just, just say that you've been with us for a long time, which is very good and uh, well deserved. So he's a professor in computer science at UBC in Okanagan, but we all know him and love him from his days at uh, Manitoba. The University of Manitoba, where he put Manitoba on the map. And we know this because we have a lot of presence here from the University of Manitoba in the middle of nowhere, flooded, etc. So his uh, research then is uh, data visualization and uh, sense making. He, uh, he has a, a chair, a Canada Research Chair in Ubiquitous Analytics. And that's, uh, he's made his mark on our world in that area. So without further ado, Thanks. please, uh, let's hear from your, Thank you. what you've been up to. Thank Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, I'm going to switch presentations and go to mine. Oh, if I can find the cursor. Yeah. Okay, let's hope this works. Very well, thanks. Thanks for the very lovely introduction. Thanks uh, to, to thanks for you all for coming here today and to, to listen to what I have to say. It wasn't, I wasn't quite sure what to really present about, so I'll just sort of give a brief tour about some of the ideas that uh, we've developed over the past few years and sort of directions that we are hoping to, to go into. Uh, but before I do that, as Deborah mentioned, <coughs> I. Uh, I've been at the University of Manitoba for 19 years, uh, since 2002, in fact, after graduating, and then just recently moved uh, to the uh, Okanagan campus uh, of UBC uh, in January of this year. So I've been there for now just four months, uh, and it's kind of nice to come back to GI. Uh, it was probably one of my first conferences as a student, uh, where I met a lot of uh, current colleagues that you know, I still interact with. Uh, and, uh, and, and I've enjoyed those days a lot, so it's nice to see this sort of hybrid kind of style come back and to see people in person here. So uh, before I go into the talk itself, I want to give thanks to a few people. Um, prior to joining the UFM, I was actually a PhD student at the University of New Brunswick, uh, and this was uh, work that I did with Colin Ware way back when I was interested in visualization of software engineering graphs and diagrams. And Colin really took me on as a PhD, and you know, I, I'm really grateful for his mentorship throughout those years uh, and the work that we did then. I was then quite influenced by the work of John Stasco in the visualization community. So at some point, there was a lot of talk about you know, introducing interactive <coughs> measures and interactive means in visualization, the importance of it. And so this, this paper had quite a bit of an influence in me, and from that point on, I mostly worked on interaction techniques and interactive systems. And I would consider that my mentors in those fields would be Carl Gutwin and Sriram, who, you know, now, of course, uh, University of Saskatchewan and University College London, uh, but who are key members of my sort of growth in, in this area. I also want to thank the over 200 and, it said, 285 collaborators, uh, including students and, uh, you know, various other uh, colleagues uh, throughout this, this, this space. And of course, thank uh, the different funding agencies without whom we couldn't actually do research. I want to put in a plug for the current, uh, the current call petition for helping support increase uh, student, graduate student funding. So if you're not aware of that, please uh, come and see me or you know, I'm sure there's some circulation going on, uh, but there's some you know, petition going on to NSERC about uh, supporting uh, increased funding towards graduate students. And uh, I'm a big advocate for that. Uh, and the reason for that was actually NSERC supported me throughout my, uh, my graduate studies as well, and so I realized the importance of that in our, in our education. So now coming back to the actual talk. Um, so if you look at the evolution of computing, of course we see different paradigms emerge, uh, and of course paradigms build on one on top of the other, and so you could you know, go back to the era of sort of personal computing, uh, and much you know, other styles of computing, other paradigms of computing, of course, before then. 
Uh, and you know, in the sort of 90s, you look at mobile computing, which of course then took off in the, in the 2000s. Uh, the idea of ubiquitous computing, which was introduced very much earlier on, but sort of, you know, you see it being more pervasive uh, today. And we're seeing sort of another flavor of computing, which we, we refer to as in situ computing. So this is where your <coughs> computing is actually embedded in the physical activities that one is carrying out, and the idea is that computing will actually support us. So these types of computing don't really disappear. They really build on one another. Uh, and, but when it comes to user interfaces, oftentimes we think about porting designs from previous paradigms into our new paradigms. And we need to perhaps think about you know, changing that to some extent. And so when you look at in situ computing, we need to think about, well, how can we somewhat consider alternative interface paradigms, alternative interface design rules when we try to think about you know, presenting information, interacting with information in this space. So just as a sort of a reminder of in-situ computing, it's the idea that you have some kind of a computing support for some kind of a physical type activity. And these are basically systems that you know, support users in the context of what they're really doing. Now when we look at it, you, know, you look at concurrent platforms such as you know, Tablet of Year, they don't really quite support this idea of in situ computing. You know, your hands are typically taken up for the real world activity that you're doing. Either your hands also, more importantly, your cognitive efforts are dedicated towards that primary task. And so the question becomes, how do we actually now build computing systems to support those sort of real world activities? And we can see you know, a range of these uh, from uh, systems like GPS systems that help you navigate in the, in the real world. Uh, I personally use a tablet to uh, navigate through recipes when I'm cooking, for instance. Uh, or even, you know, you have kids, for instance, who learn to play music through computing support as such. In some cases, we would like to have computing support, but they're really not quite there. And that's when you're trying to, in my case, you know, put IKEA furniture together uh, and somehow miss steps because I'm not really good at reading manuals. Uh, at least I've been told that. So it's nice to have some kind of a support to think about, well, how can you actually you know, have some types of systems that would actually understand what you're doing and go about carrying out in that real world task. So we are looking at it in the context of sort of embedding that information in the real world. <clears throat> and you can think about it in terms of a number of different activities. So it supports a real world activity. Typically, in situ interfaces happen on the go. So it's something that's often uh, mobile. There's an interactive loop, so there's often a sort of a feedback loop involved in information coming to the user, them interacting with it, and it going on for the task that's happening, primarily to support exactly what they're doing. So if it's a person running, it's to support their physical activity, for instance, and sort of guide them in that process. And it's actionable in the sense that the users can depend on the information or often need to rely on that information to carry out what they're actually doing. So when we think about the design of these interfaces, <clears throat> we start off with principles of efficiency, of performance, and start to think about optimizing those. In our lab, what we are trying to think about is how do we actually balance a different set of principles? So we are looking at how do you actually balance the cognitive workloads that emerge from having to interact with such systems when you're actually working in the real world. Elements of safety, so you know, there are many instances when you actually work in the physical world and using computing systems, would be considered to be unsafe, yet we see the pervasiveness of these systems appear. So if you look at cars, for instance, you have these sort of very big dashboards, uh, touch screens oftentimes, uh, that raise questions of safety. And in this talk here, I want to focus on comfort and sort of the work that we've done on comfort. It's an element that I would say is it's a little bit more um, <clears throat> hidden. It's something that we don't really talk about. And so I thought that you know, it's something that I'd like to to present and, and, and discuss how we consider uh, comfort in our design of systems. And as a holistic measure to look at how to actually use these elements of comfort for the design of future systems, in which I'll give you a case. So if you think about comfort, it's uh, defined as a state of physical ease and freedom from pain or constraint. And generally speaking, it's the easing or alleviation of a, a person's feelings of grief or distress. And so you may say, well, why should we discuss comfort in this context, right? And that's obviously the first question we need to ask is why is, why is, why is comfort important? Well, if you think about it, these types of <coughs> interaction paradigms actually have a, a significant number of challenges. The first is that the users are fully engaged in their primary activity. 
So they're engaged in what they're actually doing. Uh, their hands are busy. They don't have actually access potentially to using their hands as we would traditionally do with uh, typical systems. The interactions can be quite lengthy. Uh, and of course, they depend on making critical decisions based on the information that's being fed to them from these systems. <coughs> The second reason is that if you think about in situ user interfaces, by and large, they've been designed for very specific use cases. And so we need to think about, well, going from specific use cases to the general masses, how do we actually bridge that sort of continuum? And so there's another challenge in doing that. And the third challenge is that they actually, uh, the, the current platforms actually lack support for proper in situ computing. So the idea of using, for instance, your mobile device, which we use for practically everything, really doesn't support this form of computing paradigm. So there are these challenges on one hand. On the other hand, there are also several opportunities. And so we look at you know, a number of these tasks. We can see that there are actually platforms that are emerging that facilitate the idea of information display, information interaction, uh, anywhere and everywhere. Uh, yet, they're still you know, very, very early, and they're certainly only scratching the surface in terms of what they're capable of doing. So they are always available displays. They actually provide a fairly large display canvas, which makes it quite nice because you're working in the physical world. And then the question becomes, how do you actually embed that information and facilitate sort of hands available interaction if you design them adequately? <coughs> These interfaces also have actually come a long way and we suspect they'll actually continue uh, shrinking in size and becoming even more uh, natural, something that may be even more convenient as we move forward. The second opportunity is that they actually afford natural user interactions. The idea is that you can you know, extend the idea of touch and natural user input in space. <coughs> it affords 3D input, which is nice to work in the physical world. And generally speaking, they minimize the use of input peripherals. And so this is another element that's, that's quite nice to, to consider. <coughs> so when we think about um, the idea of comfort, we use typically you know, our NASA TLX, a task load index, which is quite convenient but generally speaking, if you think about the TLX and the questions that come from the TLX, they really occur at sort of the end stages of your design. So you've, done, you've gone through the design process and now you're trying to collect some information about, well, what was the degree of comfort, what was the degree of cognitive workload with such tools that you've designed? And so they come at sort of the summative phases of the interface design and not really at the formative stages. And so here what I'm trying to suggest is the idea of providing tools that might actually facilitate the actual design process itself. <coughs> I'll talk about projects under three different categories. I'll talk about uh, perceptual comfort, uh, physical comfort, and actually social comfort. So we think about perceptual comfort. Some of the projects that we've done have looked at the idea of embedding this information in the physical world. And <coughs> unavoidably, you're going to actually have this issue of the information blending in the background. And the question becomes, is when you have the background of this type, you have some foreground information, how do you actually make it such that the contrast between the foreground and background is preserved to one extent, is heightened, but also that you have some degree of fidelity between the information that's actually presented and, 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 and used. So we know that you know, when you have poor color contrast, it has this cascading effect which affects the eyes, affects the stamina of your visual system, affects your capacity to actually sustain concentration levels and ultimately leads to cognitive fatigue. So we've looked at uh, layout-based solutions. Uh, let me see if this video will run. The idea is that you kind of <coughs> understand a little bit of uh, the information in the space uh, around the user and you adapt the interface so that you can actually embed the content in places where you can achieve potentially a high degree of contrast. And so you can, you, can, you can take that approach and you can extend it further to also include things like avoiding salient information in the space so that you don't have to cover, for instance, those critical uh, elements uh, in the environment. And from there to be able to adjust accordingly what, what is possible. So that's one way of doing it. So this, this refers to these content-based solutions where you kind of explore the space and you tend to move them around according to what you understand in the background. You have hardware-based solutions where you can basically go back between sort of time multiplexing the different content that you see on the screens and to be able to see what's you know, available in front of you, but you tend to diminish you know, really what you, you blur literally what's happening in the background. These hardware solutions are good, but they actually you know, require a fair bit of hardware, which is not really practical in today's terms. <coughs> 
So in, in our work here, we've looked at issues of uh, color blending and how we can actually mitigate some of these issues. The, the idea here is that if you take some foreground color, like yellow, for instance, and you put it on a back background, that's what you see up on the top left. If it's on a red background, that color starts changing. And if it's, of course, on a blue background, it actually shifts a little bit more. So if you have a pair of glasses of such type and you have content sort of projected in space around you, the idea is, well, how, how do you actually go about identifying and making sure that the fidelity assigned by the designer of these content labels are preserved regardless of the background there, or at least come close to what is intended by the designer? So you can use your camera to extract roughly where the background image may, may rely. And if you're trying to project yellow, the question is, well, what is the color that is going to be dropping onto? And if it's green, the question then becomes, what should be my display color? <clears throat> so this becomes a function of your blending function, which is based on the material properties, as well as the rendering properties of your display. And so in this project, we use the LAB color space. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice space because basically it uh, sort of amounts to about some 60 million continuous colors. Uh, in this image, you see the LAB color space, which is kind of a uniform color space. And you can kind of translate the uh, CIE or the RGB gamut into a CIE LAB color space by kind of dividing it into bins. And so you kind of get something to this effect over here, where you can kind of break it down into this sort of discretized space. And this is work that was coming by, uh, that comes from Jeffrey here and colleagues, that basically looked at the idea of how to uh, sort of a color naming kind of task. Uh, to be able to, to, to discretize what you have in, in that area. We looked at that and then we kind of considered it across different display types uh, with a colorometer looking at sort of a, 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 a sort of a lab fabricated see-through display on the bottom left and at the time a Lenovo kind of handheld device uh, that had a transparent mobile display. And you can get the profiles of these, these, these functions quite efficiently using sort of a, a colorometer. And this is what you get. So if you have, for instance, on the left, you have the CIEB uh, discretized color space. In the first, or the, the, the lab-made device, you have sort of the color space you see to the top right. And the one on the display is at the, at the bottom right. And so from there, you can sort of say, well, if you have a color, you say, for instance, blue in this space here, the question is, where does it come about in the other sort of color space or rendered by the other device? And you see that happening, you know, appearing somewhere and sometimes maybe not even appearing within that color space. So what's nice about this CAE space is that actually the colors here shift quite uniformly. So when you assign a color to the space and you, you affect it by some other, interjected with some other uh, element, you tend to basically shift the kind of space in a linear format and has this nice property of being able to, to give you certain, certain elements that you are you know, mostly deterministic in that sense. So then coming back to our question is, you know, if you have a background color and your target color, and what we do is we basically go through a brute force approach within that color space to identify what might be the actual color you want to use, and you then establish that that's the color you want to be able to show uh, so that you can actually preserve the original color. And so this tends to work uh, relatively well. Of course, you can expect that such, such uh, an algorithm or such form of an algorithm doesn't actually apply to a head-worn display, to a smart wearable display. And so it's something that you know, needs to be optimized further as they get into, or if you try to uh, kind of move them into, into, that, into that environment. So here you have the corrected <laughs> images. Uh, here's another set of corrected and uncorrected images with the algorithm. And you, you tend to see that you actually get to see uh, sort of an improved contrast with reasonable color fidelity with the uh, corrected images on the right. And here's a sort of a brief video kind of making or showing some aspect of that. So this is sort of the correction that's off, and with the on correction, you can see sort of the contrast in particularly the blue-green shades tend to uh, appear much better. So of course you can do all this, and this can be you know, quite, uh, quite interesting from the perspective of preserving color. If you're interested in only legibility and the providing comfort of legibility on such classes, you can actually do something that, uh, <coughs> that was done uh, over here, and this was a paper that was published by colleagues in, uh, in, in, uh, at, in a few years ago, where you can actually go from light mode to dark mode and sort of assess the legibility of text on sort of these kinds of background modes. And you can see that with uh, dark mode, you get actually better legibility. 
uh, less fatigue, less visual fatigue, and uh, less demand on the visual system. So the, of course, there are, there are simpler ways, and these ways can actually be done very easily on heads-up displays. And the point here is that it's worth considering methods to be able to diminish the degree of uh, fatigue, improve the degree of comfort on the perceptual system when you're trying to use these systems. So the takeaways from these projects is that, in our case, discretizing uh, the color space worked, but of course it's computationally intensive. It's not really supported on variable GPUs. Uh, and we can see that simple approaches that I just uh, showed earlier can actually resolve certain constraints. So you can sort of use dark mode for reading text on optical C2 displays. Now, unless the background is fully occluded, <coughs> the content overlay is still an open challenge. And so we are still exploring the idea of how to go about preserving encoding, so visual encodings that are provided by the designer, uh, regardless and you know, dependent on color luminosity, luminosity uh, in the environment, color background that the image is projected onto, and how to go about adjusting those in real time so that the user doesn't, first of all, notice the changes, but secondly, is able to uh, read and interact with those systems in an efficient way. So moving away from perceptual comfort, we looked at elements of physical comfort in these spaces. And if you think about it here, where you have the canvas is sort of you know, spread out in your entire space, uh, mid-air input is typically considered the de facto sort of approach for interacting with such uh, types of systems. But these are unsustainable for very lengthy interactions, right? So you cannot really sustain such interactions for a long time. And so the question is, you know, how do you go about producing interfaces that facilitate interacting with such systems while you're in situ? So there's this common syndrome referred to as the gorilla arm syndrome, and uh, this is what they say about it. It's a term engineers coined about 30 years ago to describe what happens when people try to use these interfaces for an extended period of time. It's the touchscreen equivalent of carpal tunnel syndrome, according to the new hacker's dictionary, or whatever that is. The arm begins to feel sore, cramped, and oversized. The operator looks like a gorilla while using the touchscreen and feels like one afterwards. Right? So the idea is that, of course, you cannot sustain this. You start looking strange, and your arm actually is fatigued. And so we did this work on consumed endurance. Uh, if I can get this to play. Mid-air interfaces facilitate natural user interactions as users freely move their arms in space to interact with the computing system. However, a common complaint among users of such systems is the feeling of heaviness and tiredness of the arm, a condition colloquially termed as the gorilla arm effect. To obtain an objective measure of effort for midair interactions, we propose a new metric called consumed endurance. Consumed endurance is the ratio between the time used for the interaction and the available endurance time, a measure derived from the biomechanical structure of the arm. So, so in this work here, we are very interested in looking at, you know, if you're doing mid-air input, you're applying a lot of forces really on the shoulders to be able to inter interact with such interfaces. And so we look at measures of torque, and to be able to do that, we sort of look into the, bio you know, the biomechanical literature and sort of <coughs> using pre-existing formulas derive what consumed endurance may be. And so it's basically the sum of, you know, forces applied uh, by the shoulder to be able to maintain this body of mass, which is composed by your limbs over here, in this midair action. And so we did a number of studies looking at whether we can sort of, you know, use this metric in designing systems, uh, where we looked at, you know, potential ways of uh, selecting items in the interface, uh, potential placements for the, uh, for the screen, for instance. Uh, of course, uh, non-usable systems as well, so you would never use your left hand, for instance, for selection, but to be able to basically tease apart the different factors that could influence, you know, how you interact with midair. And so we, we come up with several, you know, rules and guidelines that come out of this. So for instance, uh, of course, smaller screens, so 25 by 25 versus a 35 by 35 would be more efficient. Um, <coughs> selection method uh, plays an important part, so how you go about selecting in these interfaces is, is critical. And then we actually use this for designing systems, and in this case, the we designed the idea of a mid-air text entry system where we kind of considered a grid for your text, you know, text labels to appear. Uh, and it turns out that you have sort of a heat map of this type where the top right corner is where you typically have the most amount of consumed endurance, the bottom left, the least amount of consumed endurance. And so you can readjust your keyboard according to the frequency of letters appearing in the language 
to introduce them in regions that are, of course, less fatiguing. And so you come out with a keyboard like this, and it turns out that according uh, to, the, to our work and the studies, we see that actually users expend far less effort with the Seattle keyboard just by simply rearranging how the letters are distributed in that space versus you know, pasting a QWERTY keyboard or any other keyboard. And so this comes to the point earlier that it was made was you know, the idea of basically transferring interfaces from one paradigm to the other doesn't really necessarily work as efficiently. And so the idea of being able to consider uh, a whole host of issues beyond just performance becomes really critical and becomes important. And so the takeaways from this work was the idea of you know, where can you place the, the display and how much effort you want the, to, 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 to exert, uh, to have the user exert when interacting with them. Uh, there have been models since that work that have actually uh, extended that work and have gone you know, looking at further details of how you can actually uh, enhance further uh, your understanding of those systems. And in the ra last realm on in situ interfaces, the idea of social uh, comfort. The idea is that such interfaces occur in natural settings, in real world settings, and we need to also consider the ideas of, well, you know, does it actually work as comfortably or as socially acceptable as, you know, typical interfaces? <coughs> So uh, sort of a, you know, I would say it's not a stock photo, stock video uh, to explain you know, the issues with such types of interface in the physical world where uh, are they really socially acceptable? And so there have been a whole host of work in terms of social acceptability, uh, including work that we've done in our lab. And we believe this area is actually quite important uh, for a number of reasons. And so we, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but we looked at it from a perspective of performers and observers. Uh, something in the methodology that wasn't looked at quite seriously. <coughs> and if you look at the studies, they are largely focused on people performing sort of the interaction and then having them assess how socially comfortable they feel. Uh, you have a smaller group of studies looking at observer-focused studies, and then you have another group of studies looking at, at both. And so we sought to compare you know, the idea of how do performers and observers feel in general about these types of uh, techniques. And we looked at them in the, con in the context of input, so the idea of hand gestures, so sort of very noticeable input versus subtle input. And the question becomes, you know, uh, how, how, how do observers and performers respond uh, to such systems? And I'm not sure why this video is not playing. But anyway, these were the different contexts that we looked at, uh, the idea of hand gestures, voice, head movement, and, and, and so on. And <coughs> by and large, you actually start seeing differences, right? So whereas previous studies only considered one aspect of the equation, actually looking at both elements of it make, make somewhat of a, of a difference, uh, considering the diff depending on the different types of techniques that you, that you use. We also looked at methods of collecting that information. So you know, can you actually crowdsource this so that you can actually get a larger response uh, to your social acceptability criteria than sort of just a, a smaller group of people. And, it, and sort of we had this lab style study where we looked at participants watching video clips, uh, performing tasks while wearing the head-worn displays in public and you know, rating those versus watching the video clips uh, online and rating them. Uh, and what we find that actually you can comfortably perform these studies uh, using the crowd and not really notice a significant difference, at least from the studies and the data that we gather. And so it's quite comforting in that sense that we could potentially relegate these studies you know, and collect a large number of responses to be able to say something meaningful about them. So in terms of takeaways, we see that uh, you know, socially acceptable design may affect the choice of uh, interaction methods uh, that we design. Of course, subtle, less noticeable designs are, are favored uh, when performed or viewed in public. And we see that actually crowdsourcing is a reasonable alternative, but only from a perspective of the uh, observer, perspective of the observer. So I just wanted to wrap up and show a case study of how we kind of tend to apply these, these types of principles of comfort uh, in the design of our own systems. Uh, and sort of it's sort of the mindset uh, that, I'm, that I'm hoping to, to ingrain in sort of how we go further in designing interfaces in this realm. And so this is an example project 
uh, by a PhD student here, Sharif, who basically looked at the idea of uh, mid-air uh, displays and mid-air interactions and considered the idea of potentially moving them from mid-air uh, to your hand. <coughs> and so from that sense over there, you have the contrast that can be fairly well controlled because you know what the background color is for the most part. Uh, your arm is relaxed because it's sort of closer to your body. And it's very similar to mobile input. So in terms of social acceptability, there's a paradigm that's al already accepted in terms of how to go about doing it. And there's already pipelines for kind of doing body proximate interfaces. So from these glasses being able to capture your hand postures to be able to make some sense of it. And so we've done some work looking at how to lay out that content, minimizing, of course, what you put uh, around the hand if possible. And this was sort of some preliminary work uh, using AR glasses uh, where you're projecting it and you sort of orienting it with the hand. This was uh, a much earlier implementation. Uh, we then further looked at the idea of potentially actually deforming the interface so that we can actually stretch it so it actually sits attached to your hand. And it tends to actually work out quite nicely. Uh, the contrast element is actually preserved to some extent. Uh, here we are showing it as a simulation uh, in, in VR. Um, <coughs> where you have the potential of using a hand proximate interface uh, in the, and in, in some cases using it with uh, by manual input, for instance. So this is just an ex example of you know, the potential idea of uh, interfaces that can be used or transformed for such paradigms. Uh, and going forward, we are, you know, like I said, the idea of comfort is not something that we overlook. It's uh, multidimensional. There's sort of the social, physical, and visual dimensions to comfort. Uh, but there are also obviously other types. So there's the cultural, the contextual, the environmental. Uh, we're looking at a framework for you know, objective assessment of comfort in in situ interfaces. Uh, and you know, we are looking at how to make it an integral metric in our designs as, as emerging technologies uh, come forward. So what are some broader implications of this? Uh, can comfort extend beyond oneself, but also <coughs> considering those around us? So for, by and large, when computing is happening in the physical world, uh, you also need to consider sort of your entourage, sort of those who are in your proximity, and see whether these sort of types of interac interactions and interfaces can sort of consider your social dynamics in, in the space around you. Can also considerations for comfort and particularly social acceptability influence policy making? So for instance, in the case where you have a large touch screen in, uh, in, in Teslas, for instance, or in cars, uh, what are the policies around that? And how do we inform uh, the idea of you know, safety and can we actually inform policymakers and help guide them in that process? <coughs> and of course, there are also cross-cultural meanings of comfort, and I don't think we can also neglect those. It's important to consider what those might mean and how we can actually go about designing systems uh, to accommodate those. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank my uh, anonymous uh, person who nominated me for this award. Thank you, I thank uh, the, the community for the award itself. Uh, of course, uh, I can't, we couldn't do any of this work without the dedication of so many bright students. I've had the fortune of uh, having worked with me who've taken a leap of faith and, and joined our lab. Uh, this is a sample set of them over here, obviously, who've worked on different aspects of the projects I just presented. Uh, the university that has sponsored my work, that have hired me, the funding agencies, and also corporations that have actually supported um, a lot of the work that I've done. So with that, thank you. Thanks for your presence this morning, and uh, happy to uh, field your questions. Thank you so much, um, but but mostly I learned that you cook, so I'm coming to your house, and I'll, I'll never invite you to put a, any IKEA furniture together. So. <laughs> All right, we have a question. Uh, thanks, thanks for the great talk. Uh, in the uh, eye glasses example, I noticed that it's kind of difficult to. Uh, see a white color in the, no, it, a dark color in a bright background. 
And I think that's due to the fact that the eyeglasses are transparent. And I, don't, I wonder whether there is any way to uh, like deal with this kind of problem. I mean, I know that there are some glasses that maybe there are some particles in the, in the glass and you can kind of like block the area so that you can display a dark color in that background, but it kind of conflicts with the fact that you want to look through the glasses, right? Like you, if you block that, then you, can, you can't just seek the, uh, the background. So I guess it's a conflict, but so I just wonder whether is there, there's any good fix to this kind of problem. That's a very good question. Uh, this, this has been a known problem since the introduction of these optical see-through displays. We don't have uh, an idea to how to fix that, particularly. Uh, I think it, it comes to being a combination of just simply what you provide at the hardware level, uh, but possibly what you could also do through the engine itself and how you can actually render it. Um, I don't have a clear answer, unfortunately, <laughs> to that question, and so I'd be curious to you know, talk to you later and see what, what you have in terms of what you have in mind. Um, if the color, the question here is if the color fidelity is not important for the problem, then you may want to consider whether you want to keep that, uh, that car, for instance, in that example, at that color. Right? It may be that you don't really need it to be there. So uh, as an example in some of the problems you're looking at, when you have a designer, for instance, produce a, a visualization of some sort, in those instances, the color actually have meaning, so they encode actual meaning. And, and there, we are interested in, uh, actually a student currently is looking at the idea of how to preserve those encodings so that you can actually make sense of the, the information that's being presented uh, without losing those meanings, but also preserving the contrast that's available in the screen. Now, if you don't need, or if, the, if that content doesn't actually embed semantic information, then you may want to actually ask whether you can not change the color altogether to preserve contrast before you do anything else. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, so, uh, I just riffing on the discussion you just had, I'm, I'm imagining glasses with circular lenses where if you imagine having two polarized filters, one on top of the other for each eye, the user could mechanically rotate one filter and smoothly vary how much light is coming through to make it as dark or as light as they want. Um, I wonder if that'd be a way to, to allow the user to have more contrast with, with whatever the virtual imagery is. Anyways, I, I was, um, I was interested in the, the project where you had the person uh, sort of looking at a virtual smartphone, so to speak, in their hand. So it's sort of like they have a smartphone, but not really. Uh, have you thought about ways that the, uh, the user could do virtual pen input without really holding a pen? Or would it be just be like a, they use their finger, like their finger painting, or are there, are there uh, other ways we can imagine the user doing that without a physical device? Mm, so the short answer is no, we haven't thought of it, but uh, I think that's, a, that's actually an interesting idea. Yeah, I think there was a, I think, was it this year that uh, actually Sid had, Sid Fels had work published, it was probably at this Kai or last year's Kai, where they basically inferred the posture of the hand to kind of assume the type of object you're gripping. And then from there to be able to apply whatever properties of that object onto your motions, right? So if you kind of held uh, sort of a, uh, an object that had sort of like you could, you know, you could, uh, like this, right? You could up and down the, the switch. Uh, you could your grip could actually infer the type of object that you know within a set of objects, and your motions of your thumbs in this case here could, for instance, enact you know the action of a of a button, for instance, or of a slider. So I could imagine, and, and I don't know if they actually discuss it in the paper, the ability to be able to extend it to sort of you know your tripod grip, which you typically have with your hand, to be able to show hand gestures, uh, but. Um, yeah, that would, that would be, I think, something that's quite interesting and possibly even doable, yeah. Interesting, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah. I have a quick question. Oh, I will let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I will go. All right. 
Uh, maybe a quick question. Um, as a potential solution to the problem of contrast, there are some displays or, or headsets nowadays that are coming out that have these like camera see-throughs, you know? So you're blocking off the entire real world, but then you're sort of reprojecting it by capturing it with a camera. Um, so then, then contrast and opacity, r rather, is not really an issue anymore. Of course, now you're sort of masking off the person's face, yeah. so perhaps social interactions are, yeah. are more awkward. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's, a very good, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, I've seen those see-throughs through typically VR headsets, right? So where you have, like you say, the entire... When you have an optical see-through display, though, I think that problem would still be there because you naturally see what's happening behind you. Um, so, yeah, I, I think in, in the case of these video see-throughs, you're actually superimposing the pixels over the video feed, Correct. right? And so you don't have any of the blending problems that you see in the optical see-through right. uh, display. The question there becomes is, is the information behind that those pixels important or not? Uh, if it's not important, then it doesn't matter. If it is important, then you will run into the issue of you know being having or needing to some extent blend blend the colors. Um, so I think it depends really on the application in that instance. Um, but that's that's a very good question. Yeah. Thank you. One, one more question. Go. With the color um, one that you showed us, the color were going over each other, and you were choosing a color carefully. Um, I was wondering, have you thought about a color blindness? Because some of them were very red and green, and the contrast um, wor doesn't work for everybody. So how would they deal with that? Uh, that's that's a good question. Actually, we didn't we didn't consider color blindness in that project initially. I think we're just purely interested in looking at, you know, how do you maintain color fidelity at that point. Uh, you would have the same issue. So if the person had color blindness anyway, they would still have the same issues of not being able to, to see those colors. But our primary question is, can you preserve, you know, going from uh, the colors intended on the display to when it is actually projected in space, can you actually preserve those colors? And that's that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I Thank you. We have a few more minutes. Oh, we've got a question on Discord. I have like a thousand questions. I'm not going to get a chance. <laughs> For you. Great talk. Thank you. How do you think about the evolution of social comfort over time? Had we run social comfort studies 15 years ago on what are today considered common smartphone behaviors, what would we have found, and how might that have impacted the evolution of the technology? Mm. Good question. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, had we run, had, I just want to read this, had we run social comfort studies 15 years ago on what we com yeah, consider common smartphone behaviors, um, we consider these to be common smartphone behaviors, uh, but they are largely dictated by the form factor of the device and what we're given to us, right? Uh, if we had run social uh, acceptability studies 15 years ago on perhaps some of the earlier devices that came out, my suspicion is that we would have probably identified a number of issues uh, with these uh, devices. And so I remember um, when I was actually, so one of the things they did early on was teach a course in mobile user interfaces. And <clears throat> my understanding is that the producers of the Palm Pilot actually walked around with a wooden prototype in their pockets, in their hands, to kind of settle on the size of a mobile device. Eventually, that was what was adopted later on by future iterations of mobile systems. But those designers didn't really consider you know, the idea of being able to look down at the screen as being something that was uh, socially comfortable or not. It was purely as a result of what technological abilities we had and what was possible to be able to you know, produce something to that effect. I think the, the idea is that we ultimately become accustomed to you know, whatever we see others doing. Uh, and there's this sort of trade-off between utility and awkwardness, right? 
So we are willing to be fairly awkward if the system has a large amount of utility. If it has a very low level of utility, we are not really willing to give up that degree of awkwardness. And so I think the same is with these types of devices. When you have something that's a head-worn device and you're trying to interact in space in physical world, how, you, how useful is that system? What is it providing you? How much more is it providing you more than any other kind of paradigm that you have available? Um, so I think there's sort of that kind of issue you need to consider. Um, but I'm not sure. I mean, that's, I think it's a very good question, something that I have to think about in terms of, you know, what, what, how would these devices look and behave if we kind of ran those studies uh, or we considered these uh, 15 years ago? And I think actually the studies that we run in social acceptability are actually fairly limited as well. So I don't think they're really, uh, they, could be, they could extend far beyond what we tend to do. Uh, and so, you know, there's also some limitations in the methodologies themselves, uh, where typically uh, I haven't seen really any longitudinal study, for instance, uh, looking at the social ac acceptability of new pa interfaces or paradigms. And so, you know, one may want to consider, well, what's, how do you go about doing that uh, to a platform that's really not mature, right? But um, anyway, that's, that would be my answer, so. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, is it my turn? <laughs> uh, I think uh, uh, sci-fi probably would help us out a little bit. Like I'm thinking Ready Player One. Um, anybody seen that movie? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we're moving that direction with respect to access acceptability. Um, so w one of the questions I had was, you know, with respect to measuring uh, the the uh, Effort involved in uh, in the musculature, and you know I, I'm thinking about conductors, music conductors, and they go for a long time, three hours, with a little break in between, uh, conducting a symphony, and they've got you know gross motor, which is what I, I'm seeing most of, but they've got fine motor as well. And have you ever did you have you pushed this into the fine motor control area, which has a lot more bits to it to try and uh, get a handle on. Yeah, we, <coughs> sorry, we are looking at the comfort of sort of finer motor movements. Uh, that's certainly something that we're interested in. It's a little bit trickier because you have um, a different group of muscles that haven't really been, I, I would say, uh, harder to capture than you have sort of with the sort of larger, uh, larger group here. Uh, but the case of the conductors is actually quite interesting because I think by virtue of practicing or doing it so often, they actually build those muscles, and then the question becomes, you know, uh, the question of effort, you know, is 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 different in in that case over there. Um, <coughs> so, with the finer, I think with the finer, uh, the case of the finer um, um, movements, the issue is that you can um, you can, you know, you can potentially um, get sort of a, a limited sense, a very limited sense of what those movements might do from sort of a muscular perspective. Uh, because you don't really have, you know, like I said, very big muscles over here except for what you have around the thumb. And so uh, one of the projects that we are looking at is, in particularly in the HPUI context, students are actually looking at what does it mean to be able to interact with this surface here if you're going to be doing that over something that you know you're going to be doing it over here and we don't actually have an answer to that yet so <laughs> so if you have any suggestions in that realm uh, students are actually looking at it currently so be happy to I have a couple other about. ones you know the hand and the the arm those are good things but you know they're needed for lots of things we, we use our hands and arms for lots of thi different things mm including interaction, but we don't use our feet for a whole lot of things. Mm. Um, yeah. Have you looked at other <coughs> body parts besides the, uh, the hands and the, and the uh, arms? Yeah, so we actually did look at, so uh, we have looked at feet in the past. <laughs> uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, <coughs> there's a fair bit of proprioception that you can get out of feet, but it's still very limited. You don't have the same types of motions. It's also awkward, uh, you know, you might be able to do it if you're sitting for some time, maybe standing, but not for really extended periods of time. Um, I think voice is a very good modality to be able to use in these interfaces. 
but it has its own, of course, set of limitations, and you know, there's a lot of work being done over there for many years. Um, <coughs> ultimately, I think you know, for any of these types of in situ user interfaces, some level of multimodal input would work best. Uh, question is, you know, <coughs> and I think it also depends on the applications, obviously. So obviously, for certain types of applications, your finger would suffice, uh, but for others and other contexts of usage. You know, might be more than just your hands or your fingers. It might be, you know, your voice, for instance, or other types of input. So, well, I was just thinking, public dancing might be much more acceptable than, you know, wandering around with uh, things on your head. <laughs> definitely, be more entertaining. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, we're gonna. Yeah, we need to wrap up. So, I don't have a watch. So thank you very much for a really fun talk and, uh, and terrific answers and questions, everybody. Um, if we could thank one more time. And now that he, you know, he did all his work, so now he gets his reward. <laughs> there's, your, there's your award. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Our next speakers and invited talk week. I'm here to offer a lens into a different media. Hang on. Music. <laughs>
And so teams have to um, teams of artists and scientists they they team up to to create uh, songs to compete in the contest. And this is also a way to really encourage the collaboration, uh, this multidisciplinary collaboration, uh, to really get this feedback loop between uh, people who are building the tools and people uh, who are actively using these tools in their uh, artistic practice. So uh, if we uh, scaled it up, scaled up the conference uh, the contest last year uh, to to. Uh, international uh, kind of audience and, and contestants. So a, a wide variety of uh, songs and genres were uh, part of this contest. And we're organizing it for the third year this year, and the contest is really growing. And uh, we invite you in June uh, to check out some of the entries online. So here is kind of a snapshot of how that process looks like. It's actually pretty complicated because music has many different components and teams often use kind of different models to, to really uh, get the different components right and the way that they, they want and, and, and then put it together. So uh, easily uh, many data sets and, and, and five, five to eight models are used in each of the entries. So how do we evaluate human AI co-creativity? Uh, of course, first we, we listen to the song itself, but at the same time, this really involves going to going behind the, the scenes and, and really looking at the process itself. So as part of the contest, we have a, a list of questions to guide the teams on documenting their creative process, how they use these tools, in what ways did it push the boundary of creative expression, in what ways did it impact the workflow, the collaboration in the songwriting process, uh, and also uh, kind of asking them to really think about um, all the other considerations like culture, ethics, and, and diversity. So uh, I'll show you two songs. Uh, and the first one is actually the winning entry of last year. And the really special thing about uh, their approach is that uh, they, they really uh, by using uh, the, the AI tools, uh, created this new interdependency between songwriting and sound design. So I'll start from the beginning uh, with uh, their inspiration, which is the song uh, Daisy Bell, which was the first song sung by a computer back in uh, the 1960s. So it sounds like this. So uh, the singer of the team, uh, this is her rendition. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer do. So this is her singing the melody from Daisy Bell. Uh, and then the composer on the team uh, trained a ar melody r and model uh, on uh, Daisy Bell and, uh, and generated a, a lot of different continuations and, 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 and uh, fragments and then stitched it together. So these are kind of notes being, uh, and passages of notes being stitched together. And this is how it sounds, sung by the singer. I wanna be on time up there in the clouds Sending signs to the voice across the sky And then they fed all the singing into an audio model. And this is uh, kind of building on this melodic material, this is what the audio model uh, created. So not quite what they were expecting, uh, but then they also felt like, oh, this is a, a, a model kind of trying to, to sound like the singer and kind of capturing a lot of kind of the, the, that emotion quality of, of, of wanting to be uh, uh, sim similar to, to the singer. So they uh, decided, yeah, this might be a nice theme for, uh, for the song. Uh, and uh, this is the producer's first mix by, by incorporating uh, these sounds as a sound design um, kind of approach to the song. So I invite you to uh, uh, listen to their, their, their song online, their full song. So uh, for the next uh, entry, uh, they, they took a very um, different approach because they really needed to kind of go, uh, go back to the very beginning. Uh, they wanted to express this emotion that was, uh, that was a very unique Co Korean emotion. And it's, it's, it's vague and it's abstract, but when, when you hear it, you, you, you kind of know it. Um, it's this 
it's this intertwined uh, emotion of sorrow, the pain of division, um, the sadness uh, that's generated by splitting one into, into two. Uh, but it's also this emotion of, of uh, that someday things will, things will become better. So um, they were trying to figure out how do we get um, a, an AI tool to, to be able to generate material that's actually relevant uh, for, the, uh, for what they want to communicate. So uh, they actually had to, um, because this was very vague and they couldn't describe it directly, they had to share many references to uh, different uh, existing songs and different data sets to kind of communicate what they felt like uh, was uh, captured this, this emotion. So the, the data set creation was became kind of a very key component of uh, their their, pro their uh, creative process and also for, for communicating among the, the team members. And uh, that was mostly for uh, kind of creating the melody. So let's uh, hear a little bit of their, their th uh, the, the theme in their song. Hope you also hear the, the sorrow, but also the uh, sense of um, that things will, will become better. So uh, we just heard uh, two two songs and, and uh, uh, how uh, how uh, the the process was to to kind of uh, partner with some of uh, the the between the scientists and the artists and 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 the, and the tools. So here I want to uh, since uh, this is not a music uh, um, a conference, maybe actually start with uh, the, the basics of. of uh, music uh, and and modeling. So um, how do we model music? <laughs> there's kind of different modalities. There's uh, kind of the score symbolic, and then there's the audio that, that captures a lot of the, the performance uh, aspects. So I'll first talk about that. And then I'll talk about how do we scale up these music models uh, to capture uh, more complex uh, relationships within music. At the end, I'll talk about um, how can we design interfaces to really uh, enable people to use these models uh, in a way that's uh, helpful for them to communicate uh, their, uh, their, their ideas. So um, the music we'll start with is uh, um, more of, a, it's kind of what music students would, would start with when they learn how to uh, uh, compose music, uh, which is Bach Carouse, where uh, given a melody, you have to kind of compose the other lines and, and think about harmony and, and voice leading. So uh, this is this is we thought a, a good starting point for teaching uh, machines how to kind of uh, read and, and create music. And the representation we used is kind of very similar to to an images, uh, thinking of them as like pixels, and then there's different channels for different instruments. So uh, in music, there's many different voices, instruments playing at the same time. So in a way, it's uh, very much like a grid. Uh, if it was an image, uh, a lot of times the, we would serialize it into um, a kind of to model it in a particular order. For example, we're going to go from the top left uh, to the right, and then uh, go to the uh, bottom right. So in music, this corresponds to okay, I'm going to model one musical line and then move on to the to the second line, and so on. But there is uh, immediately a, a challenge. So we want to think about chords too, uh, but in this ordering, the chords are really far away. So another possible ordering is, okay, why don't we think about uh, the harmony first, uh, and then we move forward in time. And this is actually a, a, a very common question in music theory is, do we prioritize thinking about kind of linear melodic relationships or, or vertical relationships? So in, in modeling music, uh, we didn't want to bake in uh, these uh, kind of preconceptions of how we want to uh, look at the music. So we thought, Okay, is it possible to just model all orderings? Uh, because we want to be able to fill in any parts that is missing in the, in the music. If we only generate from left to right, then we can only generate continuations. So we thought, okay, why don't we train a model to support a lot of different masks and get the inputs and outputs to be, um, the input is masking out different random parts and the output is reconstruction. So this way, given any partial score, we might be able to complete it. And it turns out, uh, mathematically, this corresponds to kind of learning uh, all the possible orderings of, of uh, writing down the music. Here, I'll start with a toy example of three notes. So the first note is given, and by filling in uh, these blanks, uh, we're actually getting these marginal conditionals. So given the first note, what is the second note? And this corresponds to one of the factors uh, when we, uh, for example, factorize the joint according to this one, two, three uh, ordering. 
at the same time, we also get another marginal conditional, which is given the first note. What is the third note? And actually, this corresponds to a factor in a different ordering, 1, 3, 2. So if we do all different kinds of masking out, uh, we actually get all of these uh, components that we would uh, ever need for any kinds of ordering. For example, here, the ordering is 1, 3, 2. And um, you can get all of these terms from these different kinds of uh, different degrees of uh, positions of masking out the score. So when generating the music, we actually uh, wanted to imitate how uh, human composers really can go back and do a lot of rewriting. And since here we have all the different possible orderings available, uh, we can also do that kind of rewriting. So how this model generates uh, is like this. So initially, you'll see uh, it's very colorful because it's not as certain where it should put down the notes, uh, but gradually it refines itself and then becomes um, uh, it, it's it only tweaking a couple of notes. So this was actually the model that uh, powered the Bach Doodle uh, about three years ago. And the interaction uh, Doodle experience that it um, supported was given the user can put in the melody, and then the model comes up with the harmonization. So uh, I'll show you uh, an experience of uh, how that is. All right, start with an E. e do, e, so here the user is putting in a melody that he knew from, uh, from before. To D. Maybe some of you recognize it. And B. This sounds great. Now, let's click the harmonize button. Yeah, by the way, this is Paul Davids, uh, who has a fantastic piano uh, teaching guitar. <laughs> it doesn't sound too bad, right? It sounds pretty awesome. So later on in this video, he, but now, how does it sound? he shows, uh, kind of plays this on, on four guitars. Uh, so uh, in two days, a lot of people tr try this out um, and spent a lot of time <laughs> com composing. Um, so it was really encouraging to see how um, uh, kind of by, by building the, these uh, kind of models and, and interfaces, it really allows a lot more people to kind of have the experience of, of trying out some, some composing and, and, and seeing um, how that could look like. So we also have a blog post uh, kind of summarizing um, all the different melodies and the regional hits. Uh, at, uh, so um, if you're curious, you can, you can check it out and in that page itself, you can um, try out harmonizing it um, in different ways. Okay, so that was uh, an example of how we model uh, symbolic music and thinking of it as uh, many different uh, orderings of, of traversing uh, a, a, a musical grid. Uh, so next, I'm going to give a quick example of how do we model audio. So say we have the notes already. Um, a lot of times when people synthesize uh, audio, they go directly from notes to the to the audio, kind of MIDI to, to audio synthesis. But this is actually a one-to-many kind of mapping. Given the same score, there's many ways to perform it. So we wanted to allow uh, musicians to be able to control all these uh, different uh, kind of aspects of performance, for example, the dynamics, vibrato, um, and also the low level like pitch contour. So uh, how we approached it is uh, using the structured hierarchy that's very similar to how, how musicians think about music. And this work is called uh, MIDI DDSP. So here I'll show an example of MIDI DDSP synthesizing the, the, the theme from The Phantom of the Opera. And the next one is the user going in and doing some edits uh, to make it sound more dramatic. For example, the, the, the pitch glide going up in the beginning to kind of set the tone, and then more vibrato, more articulation, uh, and also at the end, uh, actually switching the, the notes uh, to, to end on a high note. And uh, also, any of these uh, parts could be uh, could be composed by by human, uh, kind of manipulated, uh, uh, kind of the details by by a musician, um, or it can be models kind of uh, generating, uh, say, the, the melody, the harmonization, um, or kind of interpreting how it could be uh, performance, uh, how it should be performed. So uh, let's see kind of a full uh, pipeline of that. So here we've uh, fed in the O to Joy melody. And then 
we got uh, the bug doodle model coconut to to harmonize it. So then we have four parts and four different and then four different uh, MIDI DDSP instruments uh, to synthesize it. And this is uh, the end result. <laughs> Uh, the data set was uh, uh, students uh, kind of playing in ensembles. So I think in the, in the final rendition, you kind of uh, have, uh, you, you hear some, some of that um, kind of that, that vibe also, like a high school marching band. So yeah, so um, how do we scale up to, to more uh, complex kinds of music? For example, a lot of music doesn't fall on the grid. Uh, there is, uh, so, so the approach we took is to not only model the, the music itself, but also the performance. And performance is, is very important uh, because, as you can see here, the top is the score visualized, and the bottom is visualizing uh, a pianist rendition. So the colors are showing the, the dynamics of how, how loud and, and soft a key, key is being, uh, being pressed. Uh, and also, uh, there's a lot of micro timing in terms of the expressive timing. So this captures a lot of kind of the musical quality that uh, that uh, listeners would 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 expect and and uh, ways music is communicated. So the data set we worked with uh, is from this uh, open piano uh, competition where a lot of uh, virtuoso pianists uh, played on the special uh, piano that can record uh, all the nuances of how a uh, pianist is playing. And in terms of the representation here, uh, we needed to add additional vocabularies uh, to capture, for example, the, the note velocity, which is how hard a, hit, a key is being hit, and also um, time shift in terms of micro timing. So before, um, to, to model these complex sequences, Arnon was a go-to method. Uh, uh, so let's hear how uh, Arnon does. So say this is the prime, um, many of you might recognize it. Uh, and then the model has to do a continuation. So this is the Arnon continuation. So, so you can hear that it tried to do a lot of things as, as the music moved and it kind of forgot where it came from. Uh, in contrast, uh, for transforming kinds of model, it's really able to look back and repeat the motifs um, throughout the, the passage. And visually, you also see that kind of um, re repeating pattern come back. And the data set was from piano competition music, so part of it is something very fast and very virtuous. So it was, it's very coherent. Um, let's see kind of an unconditioned sample. So this is uh, the model kind of generating completely from scratch. Uh, and uh, you see the, the motifs indeed also uh, in this case comes back. So I, I'm highlighting this broken line, um, which is uh, where the motifs are being, uh, being repeated and, and, and very... And we were curious why the model was able to do this. Um, it must be kind of looking back in some ways. So we visualized the last layer of the attention heads. And this was what you saw. And when we saw it, it felt like, yeah, this, this makes sense. Um, it's, it's great it actually looks this way because it, it kind of matches our expectation of how um, these repeating sections, when you're in it, you're actually looking at the previous sections that were very similar and kind of building up that progression. So I'll play you um, how, kind of in real time how the model is thinking and looking back as it's generating the sample. So stop there. Um, okay, so now we have a kind of uh, we've seen some examples of, of how to how to model music. Um, now, how um, when we have such a model, how do we design interfaces to kind of enable people to use it um, and uh, use it in a way that they, they, they feel agency and 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 control and, and can use it to communicate something that they care about? So um, this this makes uh, uh, kind of asks us to think about. We, a, a lot of times traditional generated models, we're, we're thinking very much in a bottom-up kind of way of how do we model the structure of the data. Um, and then the model interface is, is this very low-level interface of um, like given what's uh, the context, like generate the, the next node. But this might not be the interface that users find most natural. For example, users might want to um, be able to explore many different options. 
and also might want to kind of steer the the model in in kind of uh, in a higher level way. And what are their their goals? Um, this uh, would also shape um, can also shape how we want to design the tools. So I'll walk you through one example of that. So uh, we were thinking, how can we use a kind of this auto regressive model to support the creative process? So we we all experience how there's a lot of exploration that happens, kind of trial and error that happens in a creative process. And we want to try out many different things and, and see many different examples. So we thought, okay, why don't we just make the interface into kind of more of like a tree search. Um, and at each part of uh, kind of the, the tree, um, uh, you can you can really steer what direction you want to go into. So I'll play you um, an example of kind of the early prototype that we um, we built. So here you see it's, it's kind of a, a, you have a, a tree, a forest. And I'm exploring like for these different starting notes, um, how they sound, to decide if I want to go in and explore more. So this one I decided, okay, I'm going to hear it more. I decided to continue exploring what might be possible. Okay, I'm at the last one here. Um, so I'm just gonna sample a path like through this tree to, to kind of get a sense of what's possible here. Okay, um, I get a sense of what's here, but I want to really control every turn. Okay, that turn is interesting. So I'm gonna go with that. That's a nice continuation. Mm -hmm. I like that last one. Hmm, curious, actually when that ends. So now we hear the whole thing. So we thought, can this tool enable novices who, who ordinarily don't, don't compose music to, to actually compose music um, that communicates something about um, how, how they feel? So we, we thought of, oh, why don't we have uh, a communication game to kind of evaluate if these tools or these model improvements are actually helpful downstream uh, to help people kind of communicate. So we have an Alice and Bob uh, kind of set up. And uh, in this study, uh, Alice is given a card um, and this is kind of the emotion, the story that uh, she wants to communicate. And she uses different interfaces to compose different snippets of uh, uh, music. And then Bob has to listen to it and decide like which one actually evokes that uh, imagery better. So um, I, I, right now I'll just skip to um, kind of showcase what people uh, were able to uh, kind of come up with musically um, in this game. So there were uh, kind of different cards uh, for, for different uh, kinds of stories, um, and uh, I, I, I picked some examples to kind of show you the range of, of how these uh, mini uh, compositions sound like. So uh, for this card, uh, of stuck and reflective and sad. And for this battle scene, And this uh, very dreamy, kind of curious, uh, peaceful uh, contrast. So these are some examples how a, a tool uh, empowered uh, users to really kind of uh, express themselves in, uh, musically. So uh, this is the last uh, uh, slide I have. Um, so in this setting, like Alice and Bob, we can imagine the uh, any like Alice or, or Bob could be an agent that is helping to kind of listen and or helping to generate and, and give the user options. Um, and through this kind of like calibration process, um, the, the model learns um, what what the user is trying to express. Uh, we're also um, interested in, in uh, kind of uh, using generated models to to power uh, generative RL, where we can actually uh, 
design agents that can jam with us, that can kind of be this creative collaborative agent that we can make music with and, and um, maybe trade ideas. And uh, so thinking a lot about um, how do we want to uh, kind of design this interaction in a way that's also kind of aligns with how, uh, how people jam uh, music together. I want to thank my collaborators, um, uh, without whom this, uh, all of this work would not have been possible. And also the, I want to thank the other organizers of the AI Song Contest. It's a, a lot of work every year, uh, but it's really exciting because uh, in June, uh, we invite you to, to all come listen to the songs and you'll be able to cast your vote uh, to kind of uh, determine uh, ultimately who uh, would be the winner. So thank you all for, for listening and I'm uh, excited to, to chat with uh, all of you uh, uh, in the Q&A and, and beyond. Thank you, Anna, for the musical presentation. I appreciate it. And we now know where to get our music for the next conference. And we have been struggling to find a music uh, for this conference, which is like open source, create our own music. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to take questions from the audience. Testing. Um, Mike McGuffin, I'm a professor at ETS. So I have two questions. The first one, um, are there models that can predict what the listener will feel when they're listening to the music? Like things like tension, climax, resolution, joy, mystery. And, and I'm imagining an interface where maybe the, the composer could paint emotions and then the note, notes would be generated. Is that something that's possible? There's a uh I've been somewhere at, for example, Drexel uh, University a couple years ago, uh, where they kind of first crowd uh, had a kind of game with a purpose to crowdsource how people um, felt um, when they were listening to the music. For example, having like a 2D space for people to uh, move a cursor around. Um, uh, I'll describe that game a little bit because it's really fun. So it's basically like uh, you get paired up with a, a random other person and both of you are listening to the same piece of music and you're moving around in the space. Uh, to re reflect how, how you're feeling. Um, and if you happen to be uh, kind of feeling the same as the other, other person and your cursor is uh, in a nearby space, then it lights up. So you kind of get this uh, moment of resonance uh, when, you're, when you're listening to music together. Yeah, so that in that work, they got kind of annotations from people um, and then they trained a model to, to kind of uh, be, be kind of predictive of uh, how, how somebody uh, yeah, might, might perceive. So that's one approach, kind of, uh, kind of taking a user, kind of crowdsource uh, driven approach. Uh, there's also a lot of other work kind of based on music theory that thinks about uh, kind of harmony and, and tension um, and using kind of geometrical models of music uh, to, um, to, to be able to quantify tension. Okay, so a second question is, uh, I'm imagining in the future, maybe each of us can have uh, an app that generates completely unique personalized music. So I have my personal soundtrack. Uh, and maybe there are some startups or teams working on this already. Uh, how close are we to that type of future? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think the fun part would be um, to get, um, for example, uh, if, if you're um, kind of creating your own, sa own soundtrack, to get you uh, also involved in that process, uh, where you can maybe do some of this like tree search, or you know, maybe there's some high level knobs allowing um, you to kind of uh, fine tune uh, what, you're, what you're looking for. Um, so it's like uh, really personalized that you, you also feel some agency that uh, you, you, you kind of composed some of this too. Okay, thank you. We have more questions from the audience. Hi, Anna, that was terrific, thank you. Um, when I, we, uh, we work on vibrotactile art, and uh, one of the things that happened is um, artists, visual artists, took a really different approach compared to uh, people who had a, more training in music. Um, and with respect to the tree diagram, have you ever tried it with visual artists who actually want to make a, an, a piece of art out of the visualization of the, the tree and then played it and then saw what they got? Yeah, that's a that's a really uh, interesting approach. Uh, we've been thinking a little bit about uh, that for the uh, music transformer self attention uh, visualization. 
um, to try to make it uh, very visual uh, in a way that um, kind of maybe like the gestalts of the, the visualization would correspond to some like gestalts in, in the music so that you have um, kind of this, uh, this navigation that, that, that's, that's multimodality. Sorry, I meant, so for example, um, one of the artists made like a happy face, a face out of the, the interface that was not meant to be something like that. So, so then when you played it, it felt like a happy face um, rather than, you know, somebody trying to make a, a happy piece, that emotion from, from a different perspective. So it was kind of weird. It was something odd that we came up with. So a visual artist will use the dots to make art rather than the music. And then you play it and you get something different than was intended this, from the music. In this case, was it a, was it a music interface that allowed drawing? No. And then it was not? No, a, it was a vibrotactile interface. So it's for, ah, it was right. for vibrotactile art, but it was the same idea where there were dots, essentially, that you put mm -hmm. around um, to... to affect vibrotactile uh, stimulation, stimulators. But it's the same idea where a, a visual artist took that and made a picture with the dots and, the, and wasn't thinking about you know, what the output was gonna be on the vibrotactile side of things. So this is the same, if you use visual artists who are not musically trained, will they take that tree or whatever other interface you make and make an image out of it? And then when it plays, what does that sound like? That's that's very interesting. I, I I'm trying to uh, uh, make sure I kind of understand. Is it uh, kind of going for happy accidents, or it's uh, trying to go for uh, some um, kind of other kinds of uh, semantic mapping? So so that can happen in a in a more uh, they're, they're, kind of directed way. There the the uh, the mapping is visual. Mm. So they make a piece of visual art that looks good on the screen, and then when you play that, you know that the nodes have music behind them and they, they're not playing the music in their head. They're looking at the image saying, that's a nice piece of artwork. Let me play it and see what happens. Um, and it was interesting to see how that worked with respect to the translation of visual art into a, another modality. And it was never intended for that. Yeah, there's definitely been some work, uh, for example, in spectrogram painting where you um, where where it's like a kind of a Fourier transform with a kind of different frequency in space, and people draw in that, and then uh, that could be very easily be kind of visualized into sound and, and with kind of interesting mappings. Hey, thanks for the presentation. It was really interesting. I have one question about copyright, like. A p generated piece like this, who has the intellectual ownership over this musical piece that is generated based on, I imagine, you know, data set from different songwriters? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, th I think um, uh, kind of a, lo a lot of us are, are thinking about that. Um, for example, for the AI song contest, a lot of teams uh, curated their, their own data set. Uh, for example, um, a lot of people, uh, I, I guess for a song, it often involves like a singer. Uh, so they would uh, kind of record themselves kind of uh, uh, singing in, in different ways and uh, using that to kind of create an audio model um, to kind of have uh, create new sounds as the sound design. Uh, for other cases, um, they would, uh, for example, go to archives um, for, for different uh, kind of uh, styles of music, kind of traditional uh, kind of cultural styles of music, and then uh, leverage um, that those data sets. Uh, for a lot of the models that we do, um, we also work with open set uh, source data sets and uh, for example, like classical music um, that's uh, more accessible. Uh, but definitely uh, that's, that's always a question where the model is kind of processing um, uh, kind of data created by, by musicians and um, how much of it is is kind of similar, and and, and um, how much of it is kind of if a person listens to it, they would be kind of coming up with their own variation and, and kind of interpolating in the space. 
So yeah, I think there's lots of open questions to, to think about. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we have some questions on Discord. Uh, the first one is, um, what are your thoughts on incorporating these tools or other computational slash ML with live performances? Thank you. Yeah, uh, there is. Yeah, there's one example I wanted to, to show that was uh, for, for live performance. Um, uh, I guess I, I start with a lot of the tools um, where uh, uh, we're able to build, for example, um, kind of virtual sound uh, like VSTs. Uh, uh, for it, uh, so it can be incorporated into like the music workflows and, and softwares that musicians use for for live performance. Uh, uh, so recently, Magenta launched a DDSP uh, VST, uh, which is a model that uh, you can kind of feed an audio, uh, and it, it does pitch tracking. So you can be singing, and then the output could be uh, you're you using your voice to kind of control a trumpet or uh, like a saxophone or different instruments. Uh, so that can run in real time, uh, and uh, we've had musicians uh, kind of use that in their kind of catalog of, of instruments um, and yeah, being able to kind of just control it through your voice uh, instead of like through instruments or, or interfaces. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, NLP models can be fitted to extract short summaries of text. Do you think we can generate music summaries? Thank you. That's a very interesting idea. Yeah. Um, in music information retrieval, there's definitely the problem, uh, the kind of, uh, yeah, the problem setting of coming up with music thumbnails um, and, and kind of like a music trailer. I, I guess for, for film, there's, there's also kind of the trailer that, that people are working on. Um, yeah, in music, I think so far, it's, it's more of kind of, cutting out the relevant moments, for example, maybe like, oh, this is the, the, the Hulk in the song and kind of featuring that um, kind of uh, as, as, the, as the thumbnail. But yeah, I can definitely imagine that there's ways to kind of maybe blend together like different parts of the song uh, and be able to have a, a summary that's pretty interesting. So yeah, I think that, I think that's a really fun uh, project to, to work on. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, those tools seem to be well incorporated for classical music, the already defined, defined music score. Do you think it could be ported on other atypical, in some sense, type of music where music score do, do not exist explicitly? Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so a lot of times, for example, in the AI song contest, we see people using audio models instead um, uh, because that's much more flexible um, and doesn't require this symbolic pairing of, of other information. Um, audio models are definitely kind of harder to train and require kind of larger um, amounts of data to, to be able to imitate the, the data source. So uh, you see a lot of teams kind of using that creatively and um, for, for sound design. Um, yeah, I, th I think uh, probably some form of hybrid of, of where we're having an audio stream come in, uh, but maybe we, for example, in speech, this happens a lot. Uh, uh, people will use models like VQVAE, which is uh, a, a way to kind of discretize uh, a, a sound stream and into kind of learned representations of alphabets. So even though like we as musicians might not have this, the score, uh, these models can come up with kind of a, in an unsupervised way uh, some alphabets to to be able to um, kind of speed up the training because then there, there's the, there's kind of a more discrete component to it. And I think, yeah, I think it would be interesting to kind of work with these methods and, and then also uh, kind of work with uh, musicians in tandem to kind of align these learned representations to how musicians are thinking about the music. And I think that can be potentially really fruitful. Uh, so I'm really excited this fall. I'm going to be uh, working. Uh, uh, I have a, a new graduate student coming, uh, and she's going to be working on Indian classical music, where that is uh, uh, one of the core challenges. So um, yeah, I hope to kind of come back later and, and tell you more about that. Thanks, Anna. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, right. 
we are time up, is it? Yeah, okay. All right, so let's thank Anna. Um, thank you very much, Anna, for doing this. Um, let's everyone thank Anna for being here. Thank you, Joanna, for, for hosting and a very, very kind introduction. I'm, I'm based in Montreal. Uh, 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 sadly, sorry, I, I haven't been able to be here today, but I'm, I'm in the area, so feel free to reach out to me and I'll reach out to some of you. And uh, I'd love to kind of uh, catch up in the park and, and outdoors. This yeah, summer. that's excellent. And let's continue discussing this on Discord as well. And I, I would love to chat with you about this. I had some questions, but let's, let's talk offline. Thank you very much. Have a great conference.
So welcome back. We have the AR VR session now. Hello, I'm Sheeran and I am Hello, I'm Sheeran and I am presenting my paper Push Poke Collision Based Direct Manipulation Technique for Plane Alignment in Virtual Reality. This research work was carried out in Tauchi Research Unit at Tampere University in collaboration with Medical Imaging Center, Department of Radiology, Tampere University Hospital. This research was carried out in context of jaw osteotomy planning. Osteotomy is a surgical insertion procedure performed by medical professionals on bones to shorten, lengthen or change their position and orientation. Jaw osteotomy are performed for roughly 5% of the world population. Performing jaw osteotomy pre-operation planning is an important task as it reduces the health risks. Jaw osteotomy planning process can be divided into three steps. In the first step, the points are marked on the skull. The medical professionals decide where and how to place these points based on which area are to be removed or altered. Based on these points, a plane is created. In the second step, medical professionals adjust the position and orientation of the plane accurately. In the third step, they perform the cut operation to split the bone into two sets. The accurate positioning of the osteotomy plane is one of the most critical steps in jaw osteotomy planning as it accounts for high health risks of around 10 to 20%. Currently, medical professionals plan jaw osteotomy operations using a traditional 2D screen based user interface with keyboard and mouse. They mentally reconstruct 2D information into 3D, which is complicated, error prone, and requires training. Viewing 3D medical data in 3D environment reduces the 3D to 2D information loss, provides enhanced depth perception, and ability to interact with two hands simultaneously. A user expectation study was conducted with two medical professionals with jaw osteotomy experience. They performed the plane manipulation step in virtual reality using controllers. They were able to complete the task precisely and quickly. However, they wanted to manipulate the plane with their bare hands instead of controllers as hand manipulation was more in line with the mental model. Hand tracking in virtual reality is noisy due to occlusion, differentiating ego motion from the inhibitant motion, and limited FOV of the hand tracking sensor. This makes designing for hand interaction challenging, especially for tasks that require precision. Jacobs et al. define perceptual structure as how a user perceives the modifiable attributes of the task. There are two types of perceptual tasks. Integral tasks have attributes that are changed together and separable tasks have attributes that are changed independently. They found that 3D tracker is effective for an integral task of changing the XY location and scale of a box whereas a mouse is suitable for the separable task of changing the XY location of a box and its grayscale color. Therefore, the perceptual structure of the interaction should match the perceptual structure of the task to achieve higher accuracy in less time. Previous works have investigated the perceptual structure of hand-based direct manipulation to evaluate against mouse input as a separable technique on a 2D display instead of a VR. Mouse is a well-suited input device for 2D tasks in, on a 2D screen. But when it comes to 3D manipulation tasks, using mouse becomes challenging as it lacks direct input method representation for depth. To overcome this, we commonly use indirect manipulation methods like gizmos or have separate input combinations for XY manipulation and XZ manipulation. One advantage with mouse is that pointing is very accurate and well suited for precise manipulation. When it comes to VR, having mouse as an input device is not ideal. Also there are other tracking devices like controller and hand to manipulate in virtual reality. Controller and hands are well suited for integral tasks and 3D manipulation in 3D space. But when it comes to precision, 3D devices have struggled when compared to 2D mouses in 2D displays. Some of the reasons why users struggle is that it is hard to keep the hand stable in 3D space. The partially observable nature of the problem where manipulation decisions are dependent on the viewing angle, lack of haptics or lack of physical constraints to guide the users. When it comes to hand-based object manipulation, gesture plays a key role to trigger a specific action. We can relate gestures to button clicks in a mouse or a controller trigger. So most of the times, users use grasp or pinch gesture to activate, pick and release. 
but the optical sensors that track the hand and predict the pose of the hand are noisy and prone to accuracy error. This error is transferred to the accurate positioning of the object. One of the advantage of hand over controller is that hands are versatile and humans use different hand gestures intuitively. So we explore the task of precise object manipulation and try to understand what is the perceptual structure of the task with hand as an input. Therefore, in this paper, we investigated the perceptual structure of hand-based Oshijami plane alignment task in virtual reality and compared both integral and separable hand-based technique in VR. Based on contextual inquiry with two medical experts, we created a task of plane manipulation in which the user has to place a plane between two segmented parts of cube. Literature review revealed that interaction techniques that provided users the ability to perform selection of rotation, translation and degree of freedom separately were able to achieve high precision. So we designed two interaction techniques with two different approaches for dealing with noisy hand tracking. One, the users can select these selection of rotation, translation and degree of freedom parameters. Or two, these parameters are dynamically selected based on user's interaction. In push poke, the user can use their hands and fingers to collide with the object to move it in a desired direction. In push, the user can collide the object with their hand. In poke, the user can poke uh, with either one finger or multiple fingers. We designed push poke in which the manipulation parameters are dynamically selected based on the collusion points. In custom access with CD gain, translation and rotation are performed separately. Translation handle appears outside the object in blue. Rotation handle appears on the plane in red. These handles follow the hand movements. Once the user grabs these handles, a fixed axis is created. Then the user can translate along the fixed axis. CD grain is applied to scale down the movement. Similarly, user can rotate around a custom pivot point based on the pinched point. We design custom axis with CD gain widget in which the user can select these manipulation parameters. In this paper, we aim to answer these two research questions. One, which interaction technique is objectively accurate, has least task completion time and most preferred for plane alignment in virtual reality? Two, which interaction technique matches the perceptual structure of a precise plane manipulation task? To answer these research questions, we evaluated these techniques in a user study. For this study, we recruited 12 participants. The participants were asked to do the study standing up so that they could move around the cube and observe it from different angles if required. The participants had one meter square space around them. In this study, participants used these interaction techniques to achieve minimum accuracy of 95%. The participants could press the red button once the minimum accuracy of 95% was reached and proceed to the next trial. In this study, pinch was used as the baseline condition. We used within subject evaluation to compare these different interaction techniques. In this study, participants were presented with conditions in counterbalanced order based on balanced Latin square to reduce the effect of ordering the conditions. A total of six trials are used in each condition. During this task, various quantitative data related to the overall task and the individual interactions were collected. Participants were asked subjective rating on a Likert scale from 1 to 7 after each condition. They were asked open-ended questions about positive and negative of each interaction technique to gain further understanding of their perceptions. After all the conditions were completed, the participants were asked to rank interaction techniques based on different aspects. Results show that push and poke was objectively and subjectively more precise than the baseline pinch. Participants felt push poke was easier to use, e more intuitive, felt more confident in using it than the other two interaction techniques. Participants also felt push poke was easier to learn and less tiring than custom access with CD gain. Based on these results, the perceptual structure of hand-based plane manipulation in virtual reality is as follows. The perceptual structure of hand-based plane manipulation task consists of integral and separable task. The initial large movements as an integral task and the final fine movements as separable tasks. 
interactions should dynamically select degree of freedom and RT selection based on contact points for small movements. In future work, we are planning to further iterate on these interaction techniques based on the participants' feedback. We are planning to implement the following combinations. 1. One or two hand pinch. 2. Pinch and poke. 3. Pinch and rotation handle of CACD. We are also planning to evaluate these interaction techniques for jaw osteotomy planning with medical professionals. Thank you and now I would be happy to answer some of your questions. All right, thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the in-person audience? So I'll, I'll start with one question. Um, so it seems to me the, the push-poke technique is bimanual, right? Either hand can push the, the plate or the, the plane around. Um, mm -hmm. But an, another way I can imagine the non-dominant hand being used is to rotate the entire model of the cube or the skull, right? Yeah, yeah, and you can um, use the, yeah. Like in a sense, over here we fix the uh, object. Um, like in a sense, the cube. Uh, we are not allowing the users to move it around, but yes, you could you could actually um, use two hands to put things together as well. Yeah, okay, that's true. Yeah. Did, did you notice that the users who are walking around did they tend to look at the the target from one particular place, or the, did they move around a lot? Um, the so it, it depends on the I think. Um, uh, the method. Um, so with uh, pinch, uh, the the baseline. Uh, um, uh, probably for all the all the three methods, I think when they are manipulating the uh, plane, they they are not trying to view it from different angles. And also, it differs from user to user, I guess. Um, um, most of the users were uh, were doing it uh, like post, uh, like after after they le uh, release the uh, plane to. Uh, check whether how accurate it is, or yeah, mo most prob mostly uh, in that way. But um, I think uh, push poke was uh, uh, was something which uh, the viewing angle was also reduced. Uh, like people were not actually moving around uh, much; they were able to um, uh, uh, manipulate it with with their fingers from behind, or um, even with uh, CACD. As well, like the custom access with CD gain as well. The reason is they could they could uh, easily um, correct the error which has been created uh, while being in the same view. Um, so that's something. Okay. Uh, yeah, that I observed. Yeah. So, do we have any questions from the local audience? Actually, I I felt some nostalgia when you were showing the previous work because you showed briefly a video of the Rock and Mouse, which was uh, mm -hmm. Ravan Balakrishnan's project. I mm -hmm. think that was in 1996, and I was a participant in that experiment when I was a student. At that. Nice, yeah, good to know that. Okay, we have a question here. I just wondered how you thought uh, things like either accuracy or kind of uh, time uh, sensitivity um, affect the interaction styles. Yeah, I think uh, both, uh, we were trying to uh, com compare with both of these. Um, um, uh, quantities, or yeah, both of these parameters. Um, so uh, the aim was, uh, you, you need to, we, we had to find a method which is uh, both accurate as well as, uh, which can be uh, done at a very um, short time uh, and uh, that's how. That's that's the reason why we actually explored um, these two methods. Uh, yeah, the reason is the the idea is like um, if you um, uh, so the studies actually show that um, if if you if you um, allow the user to select the uh, rotation and translation and the uh, uh, degree of freedoms um, dynamically, uh, it allows them to be um, more accurate. Um, uh, and if, if you're trying to do it, uh, these rotation and translation and also, um, uh, yeah, as, as an integral task, it's, uh, much more harder for them. And in order, when you talk, when you talk about accuracy, they would want to, uh, want the freedom to do it in, um, um, um by, by separating it. And, uh, that's how we thought of these two methods. One is, um, uh, 
uh, using gizmos um, where um, uh, you, you could use these uh, custom access as, uh, as a way to separate it. Also, um, CACD was something which can uh, reduce this, um, like which can reduce the, uh, quanti quantize the uh, motion uh, and uh, in a way guide or help the user. The other way was dynamic selection using this uh, push and book, which is uh, quite intuitive and uh, um, not a difficult uh, uh, interaction to for, for us to understand. I think we have been like accompanied with some, something like that sort of interaction. And that's why we chose these two and yeah. Okay, so we have, we have. I don't know if I answered it, but yeah, thanks. <laughs> we got time for one last question. There's a question from the remote audience. The question is: Did you consider the use of a hand itself in a flat chop-like gesture as the positioning mechanism? So maybe like a karate chop, or maybe just holding yeah. a hand flat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there, there. I think the hands are very um, um, versatile. You could do many different gestures. Uh, uh, at this point, we didn't. Um, uh, do many of the uh, different uh, poses, but yeah, the the task itself is actually involved with many different factors. Uh, some of it is like uh, one-handed or two-handed gestures, in the, uh, like indirect and direct manipulation, and like, there are many factors which 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 involves this particular simple task of object manipulation. And uh, uh, at this point, we didn't uh, do uh, other. Uh, gestures we we just used a push and poke but there are other um, um, take other in methods like flicking or uh, poke yeah poke is one of it but yeah flicking and um, punch or wave there are many other methods and there are, there are literature which uh, which talks about that but not many of them are being explored probably that's something for the future yeah okay thank you so much let's thank our speaker again yeah Thank you. Can we get the next video, please. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to my presentation on the paper. It's over there. Designing an intelligent virtual agent that can point accurately into the real world. I want to start with the motivation. Smart speakers are becoming more and more common recently. As a type of voice command device with an intelligent virtual agent, IVA, that can offer interactive actions. However, we can only hear their voices. Let's imagine, what if the IVA can embody and interact with users with gestures? I will show a demo as an example. Hey, Crystal, can you jump? I jump to conclusions all the time. Among the various gestures, pointing is a fundamental building block in communication. Dietic pointing, pointing that complements the spoken indicated reference, is the most common method to indicate things. Imagine a case that you cannot find your key somewhere and ask your agent, where is my key? An agent that can point will help you to find it by simply pointing to the location saying, it's over there. Versus, particularly if the location is very hard to describe, a smart speaker will reply, it's on the right corner of the second last, which is very hard to understand. So the dietic pointing can simplify the verbal communications, especially when it's very hard to rely on the verbal description to convey intentions, and it facilitates a more human-like interaction. However, if the observers cannot tell where an IVA is pointing, it will be difficult to support point interactions. So the research of question of our paper is whether it is possible to design an IVA that can point into the real world accurately. To design an IVA to demonstrate the feasibility, we consider the following design factors. Firstly, for the situated display, we use a spherical fish tank virtual reality FTVR display. Unlike the immersive displays, the spherical FTVR is situated in the real world coordinate system, enabling the IVA to point from the virtual world to the real world. It also offers effective 3D depth cues for the pointing perception. Additionally, spherical FTVR have been found to provide better gaze, size, and depth perception, 
compared to the flat displays. For the IVA appearance, we used a Japanese female cartoon character that was not photorealistic but offered natural, easy to control pointing avoidances to avoid the uncanny valley effect. The baby schema of large eyes can induce a pleurable feeling. For the pointing gestures, previous research suggests that humans commonly point to where they are looking at by aligning their fingertip with the gaze of their dominant eye. But this eye fingertip alignment could lead to perceptual bias since the observers mainly refer to the arm factor. To avoid this, we instead remove it and has the arm factor directly point at the targets. In summary, we design our IVA to point with an outstretched arm, eyes, and head facing the target without the eye fingertip alignment. Using our design IVA, we conducted an experiment. With a real person's natural pointing as the baseline, we mirrored how accurately a human observer can interpret the pointing of our IVA or the real person to a physical location. To answer the research question as we mentioned before, how accurately can our IVA point into the real world? Our experiment used a 2x2x2 two by two by two mixer design. A between subject, subject variable is the viewing condition. But what is the viewing condition? Well, it's related to the size of IVA. As shown here, the size of IVA is smaller than the human. If IVA and the real person were of the same distance to the participant, the viral angle covering their arms from the participant's perspective would be different. To get the same viral angle, we need to adjust the viewing distance. So there is a trade-off here. To eliminate this effect, we include both same retina size and same distance in our experiment, which is called the viewing condition. The two within subjects variables are pointers, intelligent virtual agent, IVA, or real person, RP. We also have the distance near and far as it has shown to have effect on pointing perception. We hired 36 participants. Each was instructed to sit on a fixed chair and observe the pointers pointing. They were asked to click the location in the target area they believe the pointers were pointing to. We mirrored horizontal and vertical components of the distance arrow. We also mirrored arrow bias and collect a subjective data via a post-study interview. The result shows that with a set of design factors determined, it's possible to have IIVA point into the real-world objects with comparable accuracy to a real person. Specifically, the IVA outperformed the real person in the vertical dimension and achieved the same level of accuracy horizontally. And we found participants exhibited a systematic upward bias in the vertical dimension when perceiving the human pointing. So what design factors have contributed to the findings? We will discuss two aspects. Firstly, the pointing gestures. We show the set view of human pointing here. As shown in this figure, the green dash line, we confirm that the real person in our experiment followed the eye fingertip alignment commonly found in human pointing. However, the interview results suggest that most participants mainly used a hand or arm cue to perceive the pointing direction, which means that they would basically follow the red dash line to get to the location. This will result in the upward bias and a vertical arrow. While in the IVA, the true target location will be reached directly by following the arm factor, which is how most participants in our experiment perceive the pointing. So this might be the reason why the vertical arrow was significant significantly lower in IVA. Apparently, the different appearance between IVA and the real person may also have effects like gender, realism, and eyes. The effects and the weights of all of these factors 
should be identified with future user studies. Our study still has a bunch of limitations. Firstly, our real person and experiment naturally follow the common human pointing, but the pointing has many variations. We'd like to have multiple, multiple real persons um, in future studies to test the robustness of our results as well as investigate how people perceive for different pointing gestures. Our study suggests that the IVA can point to the real world with high accuracy with a set of design factors determined. Future study should draw attention to control experiments for each of the design factors to demonstrate their effects. The gestures and languages are highly integrated components in interpersonal conversation. A future step can study the role of pointing gestures when verbal cues are given to establish joint attention with the IVA. Thank you for your time and attention. All right, thank you very much. Questions? So um, well, one question that occurred to me is, if this IVA has a camera, maybe it could see if I'm close to the object or if I'm not looking on the right piece of furniture and it could say, maybe it could say to me, no, it's on the chair or something. Or, uh, or if it had a camera, maybe it could show me a zoomed in photo of where the object is in addition to pointing. Um, so that is that something that maybe you considered or are there reasons that we don't want to have a camera in the IVA? Oh, this is very interesting proposal. Like having a camera to providing more visual uh, affordance to help the pointing, uh, like improve the pointing accuracy. Uh, we so for our research, we basically consider like the more natural interaction. So we didn't consider those kind of having the visual affordance, having a like laser beam or like the camera to better help the pointing. But that's definitely something that we could consider in the future uh, if we want to uh, improve the pointing accuracy. Uh, at the same time, not uh, ne not negatively effect, uh, impact the uh, natural uh, interaction with the real person. We have a question over here. Hi, Fan. Thanks for your presentation. <laughs> hello. Hello. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'll just try one. I noticed that the environment was messy with the human person. They had, there was a desk and a pile of things and a bunch of other things right. around it. And then with the, uh, the virtual entity, it was a, a cleaner space. It was a clear table, and there wasn't either, any other sort of visual distractions um, that were around that space. Did you ask people about you know, what they noticed or whether things were distracting them? Or I, I didn't notice uh, whether you used eye tracking, but I doubt you did. Um, but in terms of the noticing of the other environmental stuff, which does have an impact on what you look at. Yeah, yeah, this is actually a limitation in our study. So this limitation is because our uh, FDVR display is fixed in a place. It's kind of hard to move it to make sure like the environment is exactly the same between the two conditions. Uh, and uh, we didn't, uh, we didn't ask the participants about whether this kind of uh, environment could distract them or impact their result. Uh, and we also didn't hear from them like complaining like, oh, this like the different environment as like impacting me uh, trying to discern where like the person or the IVA is pointing. I think probably they are mainly more, more focused on the the gesture to try to complete the task. But yeah, this is actually really a limitation in our study. And thanks a lot for uh, like uh, 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 for for bringing it up. We have another one or two minutes. Um, 
Yeah, it, it, another thing that occurs to me is when this IVA is pointing, if she could say something like three meters away, I mean, maybe it's difficult to estimate exactly how far three meters is away, but maybe she could say something like far. Far would be like on the other side of the room or near or midway or something. Maybe a little audio cue like that could, could be helpful. I know when my wife is pointing at where something is, I'm like, come on, can you be more specific? Like I'm, I'm just lost and I'm kind of clueless that way. But, uh, but I found it very interesting that the IVA allows people to better understand where, where the direction actually is because the IV is not making this correction for where the eye is. So, okay, thank you very much. Very interesting yeah. talk. Okay, thank you. Could we have the next speaker, please? Hello, everyone. I'm Nikita Joshi. And I'm Matthew Lake here. And together, we will present our paper, A Design Framework for Contextual and Embedded Information Visualizations in Spatial Augmented Reality. This work was done with Daniel Vogel and Jian Zhao at the University of Waterloo. Spatial Augmented Reality, SAR for short, is a type of augmented reality that places digital content in the physical environment without the use of a head-mounted display. And SAR has been achieved typically in the past through projection mapping, as seen through systems like Beamatron and the Room Alive Toolkit. This creates some new opportunities for information visualizations. SAR does not require people to wear or shift their attention to a different device, which can enable more ad hoc or implicit interactions. Since digital content becomes part of the environment with SAR, visualizations are always available and much more pervasive and it is able to show the same visualizations to multiple people simultaneously. Visualizing data in the environment with SAR has been done in a few applications, like for collaborative games or to visualize inventory data in a warehouse, but we believe it will become much more common in the near future. Situated, embedded, and physicalized visualizations that have a tight coupling between the underlying data and the physical location in the environment are becoming much more common. Visualization frameworks, pipelines, and typologies are all useful tools to aid in the design of visualizations. AR Canvas, for example, is a framework for creating pervasive and embedded information visualizations for augmented reality. However, we believe a SAR-specific framework is still necessary to address the challenges related to coordinating and sharing views between people, the lack of floating views, as well as this emphasis on context-driven interactions. So we create a design framework for creating embedded information visualizations in SAR. The framework captures the user's intent, interaction, and six environmental and visualization factors, represented as a Venn diagram. An associated design process shows how the framework can be used to generate new visualizations and describe existing visualizations. First, we'll describe the user's intent, which represents the goals, motivations, and desires of the people in the environment. This is typically done through a user intent statement, like, I want to keep track of what's stored in my personal cabinet. Through the user intent statement, we can make educated guesses and inferences about other factors. So for example, because this mentions a personal cabinet, we could guess that maybe the location is an office. Next, there are six factors that establish context for the visualization and define the visual characteristics of the actual projected content. The location describes where the visualization is going to be shown, like an office. Time is when it will be shown, uh, like during a meeting. People describes who is present in the environment that may be able to see or interact with the visualization, such as coworkers. The object is the specific surfaces in the environment on which the visualization is placed, like the drawers of a cabinet. And this factor is the only factor that is part of both the environment and the visualization. Data is the underlying information that is conveyed by the visualization. And the form describes the visual form, like the color, shape, and other elements related to the visual encoding. Last, we have interaction which describes how the user can interact with the SAR visualization. This can be both explicit or implicit, 
and done through many different input modalities, like voice or touch. Each factor has a set of properties describing specific aspects of the factor. Location has properties like owner, function, and lighting. Function represents whether the location is a kitchen space, a bedroom space, a bathroom space, and so on. Form has properties like level of abstraction, visual encoding, color, shape, and anchor. Level of abstraction represents, for example, whether you're showing a bunch of individual data points, or whether, for example, you're showing a single color to represent an average of a whole bunch of data. Factors and properties can influence and inform the design and effects of other factors and properties. For example, the function of a location might suggest that there'll be certain objects that we can expect at that location, or that people might be doing specific activities associated with that location. By designing the form to have colors that contrast with that of the underlying object, it can make the resulting visualization easier to view. And if the visualization is going to be displayed in a public location, it might make sense to use a high level of abstraction to help preserve the privacy of the data owner. Here's a picture of the framework with some example properties for each factor. See the paper for further discussion on different properties. To use our framework to generate exemplar applications, we followed an associated process. At each stage of the process, we considered constraints and considerations. In other words, we pick aspects to focus on and also consider limits that the designer must work within. We also consider what factors need to be fixed or variable. A factor is fixed if it's context independent and non-interactive once the visualization has been placed in the environment. Otherwise, it's variable. Uh, the process involves moving through the framework figure based on color. So we start with user intent, then move to environment, then move to visualization and interaction at each stage, considering how the factors will influence each other, narrowing down the problem space, and refining the design of the visualization. We created 18 exemplar applications to demonstrate different aspects of the framework, and now we'll briefly highlight three important examples. We mocked up each of the exemplar applications using envisionment videos that we created with post-processing software. In this first application, the visualization reminds somebody of up an upcoming meeting uh, while providing relevant details about the meeting. As it gets closer to the meeting time, the visualization gets less transparent and moves to a surface closer to the person. So at 30 minutes, the visualization is on the far wall. At 15 minutes, it moves to the closer wall And then at five minutes before the meeting, the visualization moves to the desk in front of the person. And it can be dismissed at any point with a remind me later voice command. In reference to the framework, the object surface being used and the transparency of the form depend on time. The second application shows how differently shaped surfaces can display the same underlying data in unique ways. In this case, the data is information about a person's schedule that they might want to see as they return from their lunch break. Uh, in this visualization, different colors represent different types of tasks. For example, pink represents meetings. And so here's some of the different ways that the information can be presented. So in this first video, we have a bar chart where each bar is represented in a different banister of the overall banister. In the second video, we have a pie chart being shown on a circular table. And in this third video, we have a linear heat map being shown on a windowsill. So in reference to the framework, the form's visual encoding and style are based on the shape of the corresponding object surface. And there's a different level of abstraction associated with each chart type. In this example, pictographs on cabinet drawers show what objects are stored inside. This view updates as objects are added and removed from specific drawers. When a stranger approaches, the icons will switch to show abstract lines to help preserve privacy. And the icons will reappear once the stranger leaves. When we think about the framework, the object function informs the data theme in this case, the object stored, and the people's relationships of strangers 
will suggest the form's level of abstraction, in this case, showing icons versus abstract lines. We created a total of 18 different applications using our framework, which can be viewed at sarinfovis.github.io. To summarize, we create a new design framework for leveraging context and surfaces in the environment for SAR visualizations. The framework is composed of the user's intent, interaction, and six environmental and visualization factors, which we use to generate and describe several applications through envisionment videos. Thank you so much for listening, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, Porang. Porang has a question. Great, <coughs> thank you. Uh, great work. Um, <coughs> the uh, surface shape and function, uh, is it restricted to the ones that you showed here? Or if, if the sh shape has, or the surface has a non-symmetric uh, shape, uh, wh what do you do in that case? Do you put in a sort of a inscribed, a take an inscribed planar surface out of that and present on it? Or wh how does the framework handle that? Or has, is it considered within the framework? I mean, I guess at that point, the focus would switch to the designer. So the designer considers how that surface could be, or like how different data could be represented best on that kind of surface. So it's more the framework is guiding the designer to think, of, to think about this connection, but not necessarily how to actually make that bridge. Okay. So in this, case, in this case, you imagine that the surface has a specific function in that particular location and that the content doesn't really travel with the user from one area to another, right? What do you mean? <clears throat> so, like, for instance, in the example, you had those bar charts on the, the railing, and you had a circular surface on the table, and you had uh, another one on the windowsill. The location of that display has some semantic importance. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So, basically, the... The idea with that is that the because those those shapes are available, it kind of suggests the different types of um, graphs that could be displayed on them. And the other element of that is, for example, the pie chart shows a much uh, just shows less information given the nature of the pie chart. So because that view we saw was kind of like a lobby, then it kind of makes sense. Like, okay, we can utilize this surface in this public environment and use the pie chart because there's kind of this matching between the pie chart shows less information, but that's kind of what we want given the fact that we're in this kind of public lobby area. So it kind of encapsulates all of that. Um, and regarding your first point, we do have some examples with kind of these non-planar, regular uh, shapes as well. Like for example, displaying on like curved uh, spindles on like a chair. So it definitely can work with other types of shapes as well. It doesn't have to just be standard shapes. And I think it's just up to the designer to think about how to leverage that in kind of creative ways. Yeah. Cool, very nice, thank you. I guess one quick thing to add on the semantic part is one of our other examples, it's like in a public space, it's showing a very, very high level view that basically you need to be very familiar with the visualization to understand what it means. And so other people can look at it, but only you'll understand what it means. Whereas when you move to your office environment, it's showing a full detailed calendar because it's assumed that this is my space and I can have this level of detail because nobody else is going to be like seeing it. And that level of detail is integrated in the framework. The framework yes. handles that level. Okay, very cool. Thanks. Thank you for. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I just have a question in terms of customizability. How much a designer or the user can customize things? Can I change the colors? Can I um, modify it a little bit based on what I prefer, um, the visualization, I mean? Yeah, so regarding the level of customizability, I think a lot of it comes back to this user intent statement. So if we have like a pretty vague user intent statement that, for example, the one I described in the presentation, like if it only mentions like an object, in that case, sure, you could assume that 
maybe the location would also be an office, but you have much more creative liberties when the user intent statement is more vague. So the designer in that case, a lot of the, um, a lot of the decisions would fall on the designer, but you could equally have a user intent statement that says, I wanna show a pictograph on my personal office um, in a way that preserves my privacy. Then you're kind of showing, your, your, the user would have a lot more um, kind of say in what goes into it, and then you as a designer would maybe have less say, but you could, des you could decide things like, okay, maybe we can go from this uh, pictograph to this abstract line format when the stranger enters, but at first glance, maybe that's something that doesn't become apparent to you with a more vague user intent statement. So I think a lot of it comes back to that intent statement, but I think it, it's pretty open. You could equally have the user having a lot more say or the designer putting a lot more emphasis. I think it just comes back to what you're trying to get out of the visualization for sure. So did you also have a question, Deborah? I do have a question. Okay, go. Now, I'm imagining this on the fridge where you track the stuff that you have in your fridge. Um, do you think you could add a time element because things will degrade over time and there's best before dates and all those other things that go with food. Um, so there could be a time or a decay where things will not just change you know, for privacy purposes, but to change the image over time or the display over time, given the situation with the contents? Yeah, absolutely. Like time in the way we described it, sure it can, um, like the way we described time was more on uh, like how the visualization is shown, but you could equally think about time as specific elements of the visualization, how they will appear and disappear. So in this case, we have this element of time um, and the kind of context in this case would be the fact that food is degrading over time. So I, I think that would still fit into the framework for sure. Instead of just looking at the entire visualization as a whole appearing and disappearing, we'd be looking at kind of specific elements reappearing and disappearing as the food degrades. So that, in my mind, would be kind of similar to what we presented with the cabinet with the kind of objects at being added and removed, um, changing the actual visualization itself. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, we can envision like in the future, the fridge might send sensor data to some system, and then that system will change like some data representation that the visualization can then use. So there's also some aspect of time integrated into whatever the data source is itself as well. All right, that's Thank it you. for time. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next speaker, please, next video. Hello, everyone. Today, I am presenting our paper on accidental landmarks, how showing and removing emphasis in the visualization affected retrieval and revisitation. And this was work done with Sami Udin and Carl Goodwin. First, let's begin by talking about emphasis. Many visualizations display large data sets in which it can be difficult for users to find and refine specific items. For example, in the image above, if we try to figure out the differences between the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine from just looking at the coding sequences, it's next to impossible. By coloring or emphasizing the differences, we can clearly see the few spots where they differ. These few color spots are easier, for, are easier for people to remember if we ever need to return to the image later on. Color is essentially working as a landmark to help us remember where the differences were. So what exactly are landmarks? Well, these are visual anchors that help users remember locations. If you look at the image on the left, unless you are from London, it will be very tough to remember the different areas of the city. But on the right, you can form a visual map by simply looking at the landmarks. We can, see, we can say that the London Eye is near the Big Ben, which is near the Buckingham Palace. And it's all walkable in a semi-straight line. So we can begin to think that landmarks might make it easier for people to remember locations. Uh, but does, does that really translate to visualization? Is emphasis really a landmark? And what happens later on when we remove or change them, such as highlighting a different sets within a scatterplot? Well, that's exactly what this paper is about. And as a quick message, we found that emphasis can improve learning performance. However, it can also harm refining the data points once they are removed. So here's a quick overview of the talk. I'll go over some of the basic motivation for the work and tell us a little bit about our memory and how learning works. 
And then I'll dive deeper into both the studies within this paper. So let's go over back again to, to visualization and emphasis. So in visualization, finding items for the first time can involve uh, a slow, vi slow visual search. Once a user finds an item, the problem changes to one of re revisitation. That means finding items that they have already seen before. And revisitation can be much faster than visual search since a user can easily remember where the item was. In visualizations, this spatial learning is really just a side effect from interacting with them. And the rate of which locations are learned follows a power law of practice. In other words, the more you, the more you interact with it, uh, the easier it will be to remember a place. Outside uh, 2D environments, people learn, organize, and remember spatial knowledge by forming relations among the items within an environment. For example, think about your daily commute to work or to the grocery store. You know where the store is given its relative position to everything else in, in your path or at, or at home. If you try to find your remote control, you can easily think of it when you place it in your coffee table. You know where the coffee table is within your living room. So you'll remember a little bit easier where your uh, remote control happens to be. So our idea for this paper was to investigate whether landmarks have the same helpful effect in visualization. And we came up with the idea that when people gradually explore visualization with emphasized data points, these points can become accidental landmarks. We call them accidental since it's likely that the designer did not intend these to be landmarks. They were simply showing an interesting point. And these landmarks can make learning locations a little bit easier. What makes it really interesting as well is that while we have already painted a positive picture about landmarks and how they help memory, uh, however, once we remove these highlights during explore exploration, for example, select a different subset of the data, it can be hard to remember the locations once we take away that help. This idea of users becoming reliant on the help is also known as a guidance hypothesis. So for a paper, we decided to explore exactly that. Based on what we know about landmarks and the potential conflict with the guidance hypothesis, we designed a couple of studies to look at how these accidental landmarks in the session can help, and also what happens when we actually remove that help. So in our study, we asked participants to repeatedly find a set of seven targets in an eight by eight grid that had very few structural layout based landmarks. It was pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, basically all the hardware corners and edges, and we recorded search time, hovers required to find a target and their errors through the study. Uh, we started out by having a guided tour through the different targets. Uh, we took participants through the targets, we highlighted in blue to show them which target they were looking at. And depending on the condition, we will then have a, a bunch of circles highlighted in red or not. Following the guided tour, we had an additional three learning blocks where people simply were asked to refine the items that we had shown them previously. Finally, in the, in the in a fourth block, we either removed the landmarks or we changed the position, again, depending on the condition. So to recap, we had seven targets in our eight by eight grid. We, took, we first took them to a, through a guided tour of the targets, followed by three learning blocks, and we finalized in a, in a final block where we removed or changed the landmarks. For good measure, we also had a baseline condition with no landmarks at any moment. In total, we recruited 90 participants to go to our studies, basically 30 per group through Amazon's Mechanical Turk. So now that you have a basic idea of how the study works, uh, I'll go over through an overview of the results, focusing on our main measures. For our main result, results, we found that for search time, our results actually showed that people perform better with no landmarks at all. Another point of interest is that in the final block, those in a landmark condition had an actual decrease in performance once we changed or removed the landmarks. <clears throat> so it's very interesting to see that while landmarks did not improve learning, people were actually still dependent on them. For hover agents required to find a target, we didn't really find the main difference between any of the conditions. But again, we saw an increase in the however action required in the final block. So again, we saw that dependency on the landmarks. However, could that be just due to group differences? After all, the learning blocks were pretty much identical for two of the groups. We normalized the results by taking the performance of, of, block, first, of block one as a baseline for each group. <coughs> it, 
So we can see that the learning blocks are a, lot, are a lot closer now. Also, the effects of changing or removing landmarks are a little bit more clear. That group that had landmarks actually relied on them to find the targets, and they were very negatively affected when they were changed or removed. There are also many other results in our paper that I really encourage you all to uh, go to go see, including a breakdown by target and some subjective measures as well. So to recap, for at least for now, we can say that landmarks didn't really help people finding locations in the grid, but users actually relied on them as their performance dropped when they're changed and removed. Of course, visualizations are not really nice and organized out there in the wild. So natural follow-up would be to use a real data set and a real visualization type. And that's exactly what we did for a second study. We took a popular data set from Gapminder, basically a GDP per capita against life expectancy for countries around the world. And we repeated the same basic study procedure. We highlighted some of the countries to keep it a little bit more realistic. We highlighted countries that were specific to a given continent, Asia in this case, while the targets were from any other continent for comparison. So our, our overall procedure was identical again, seven targets, although with many more distractors and the three same conditions. Well, the overall results look pretty tight in here. In our learning, in our learning blocks, our stats analysis did find a significant condition on search times, particularly the landmark condition outperformed having no landmarks at all. In this case, when we changed and removed the landmarks, it did not affect participants as much. Performance actually remained the same from block three to block four, or even continued to improve. For hover actions, we can see a clear benefit of having landmarks. Those in the landmark conditions require way fewer actions to find their targets. And again, removing or changing the landmarks did not harm participants as much as in the first study. So what does all of this data mean for us? Well, we found that in certain conditions, landmarks significantly improve learning. We also found that removing landmarks increases the difficulty of refining them. Uh, we also found that different targets or locations are affected differently. And our participants actually told us through their comments that they use the landmarks to help them find targets. So what does that mean for visualization design? Well, we think this emphasis can make it easier for people to remember locations within a visualization. And this will happen naturally as a side effect of interacting with a visualization. But we also know that removing numbers can sometimes have some side effects. To mitigate some of the potential uh, bad effects of removing landmarks, we suggest to use traces of the previous highlights, similar to the classic real where or visit where you can find in other applications. Of course, these results actually led to many more questions that we still want to answer. We were only really able to test one type of highlight, but there are many other effects that are known to uh, be able to provide emphasis and visualization, and more work is really needed to understand whether there are, main, there are any effects of different emphasis types into how people remember landmarks. Also, we focus on a simple grid and a scatter plot for, simplic for simplicity as it is, this is our first study in this area. There are many other visualization types that we want to test in the future. And these different configurations can affect how effective emphasis can be as landmarks. And with that, I come to the end of the talk. So to recap, highlighting can serve as a landmark to improve learning, but we have to keep in mind that people can become a little bit dependent on them for revisitation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Any questions from the local audience? <laughs> Do we have a question? So uh, I, one response I have is, uh, you know, if I'm the user, I want to be able to circle things. It seems like a very natural thing to want to do. If this is on paper, I just like circle or mark or, or annotate things. Um, and I'd like to do that not just with these visualizations, but just any document I happen to have on my computer. So I wonder if you have thoughts on how, well, uh, thoughts about that. Is there a way we could imagine a general infrastructure that allows people to annotate visualizations or maybe anything so we can finally have easy annotation or? Um, uh, yeah, that's a very uh, 
good points. Uh, I would think that as you annotate yourself, uh, you're learning locations a little bit easier because you're actually making, uh, doing the work instead of you know highlighting by using a drop down or a search fun function that already does it for you. Um, I'm not really sure there's many uh, easy annotation capabilities in many software like PDFs or or stuff like that, so, or even visualizations. So I think uh, there's still a lot more work to do there. Um, but in, in this case, I think it's really easy for us as designers, developers to uh, be able to add certain functions for people to highlight or add little notes uh, to remember locations. Uh, and that way we can try to mitigate removing landmarks afterwards. Uh, so let's say you highlight certain points uh, by using a dropdown or highlighting a specific set, and then you add a note there. So once you move it, uh, it should be a little bit easier to remember afterwards. So yeah, I think there's still a lot more work, work to do there. Uh, not sure if that answers your question, but uh, that's where I'm, uh, that, that was my initial thought. I guess there's a trade-off that if the user's annotating, then it takes work. They need to have the intention and take the time to do that. But if there's this yeah. highlight thing, it, it, it sort of comes for free. The landmarks are free. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think Carl Gutwin had some paper several years ago. It was like this uh, study of networks where there were passive images behind the networks. And the images themselves were just sort of random. They didn't have any meaning. But I think that it helped some type of revisitation task. So, uh, yeah, I was going to mention, well, I can mention a little bit about that. One of my co-authors, Sam Udine, uh, he also studied about landmarks and having an image behind them and how certain, certain images have certain structures that can help you remember locations just by being there. So that's kind of the idea as well, how that can transfer in visualization. Um, yeah, just by having something in the background, uh, you, you can make an association of location and image and location in your data as well. So I don't see any hands raised Wait, yet. Up. I'm going to ask a question. How's that sound? Um, yeah. So there, in terms of of uh, understanding visual maps, um, there's I'm pretty sure there's a difference between male and female uh, ways in which you remember things and identify locations based on visualizations. Did you notice any? Male versus female perspectives, and I, I don't mean men and women. I mean, you know, these are these would be gender differences. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did not particularly look at any differences in that way. We obviously do have the data that we can look into it. Uh, so I'd be happy to follow up on that. Uh, but uh, since we're, yeah, that could that could be some interesting thing to look into. Uh, obviously, we. We had to recruit people through Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is usually heavily biased to a, towards a certain population. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to control that initially. Uh, so I, I'll, I, I may have to look into how many we have. And, uh, and that, that's a very interesting question that I'm sure will lead, lead to even more questions later on. But did you notice anything? I, I uh, not particularly, yeah. Okay, I know I certainly look at things way differently than my my sons um, as, and I just look at things differently and a psychologist friend of mine has says that's because I take a more female view of this world um, yeah that could actually it's a very just follow up if we have eye trackers we can track the actual methods that people use to search for these items uh, and yeah try to create some sort of framework of how people uh, look at information and visualizations, especially dividing into different populations and genders. Yeah, for sure, that could be uh, very interesting. Uh, I did not look into that at this point, though. But thanks for the question and suggestions that I'll take on later, later on. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting work. Um, just to follow up, uh, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Uh, in addition to uh, gender-related differences in terms of how people use landmarks and use navigation systems, um, we know in research and observations that there is a difference, uh, cultural differences as well. So people from different cultures use landmarks in different ways. They use different objects. I was just curious, did you 
I, I know it was not part of your study, but did you make any observations in your studies? Thank you. Uh, great comment. Um, I did not look into that for this paper specifically, but following up on that, I know for certain languages that people like for certain languages that are someone's main language that they may read from right to left instead of left to right. It's certainly different on how they uh, search for items. Uh, so that's something that we that would be really interesting to see if there's any main differences there and how people process information. Uh, yeah, like I said, there's many more questions that, can, that we can tackle on here and uh, will be really interesting to follow up on. All right, thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. So let's thank all our speakers one last time. And for the in, uh, in person folks, uh, just we're gonna break for lunch now, so uh, you can go eat. But uh, don't forget, afterwards we still have a jam-packed afternoon with an invited talk, two award talks from um, the best dissertations, as well as two paper talks from the best papers. So still lots of awesome stuff to come. See you all later this afternoon. <laughs>